Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. This is embarrassing. No, no, not um, at all. Not at all. You, you can probably you. start your video so that we can see you. Start my video. Yeah. Okay. Start video. Great. Brilliant. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you again for putting on uh, this important symposium and especially for allowing me to talk on an Im issue that I have been pondering for almost 50 years. Frank Nelson seen here uh, was my mentor, boss and partner beginning in my residency in Cleveland. He had published the first paper on valve regulated shunts for hydrocephalus in 1952. And as the first head of neurosurgery at Case Western, uh, he founded the first spina bifida and hydrocephalus clinic in the United States. Early in my career, I uh, cared for a young boy with severe headaches who was often seen in the emergency room. The CT scan never showed any increase in the size of the ventricles. It was assumed that the shunt was working. After several weeks of this, he was uh, seen by ophthalmology and found to have florid papilledema with some visual loss. At surgery, it was found that the proximal catheter had failed. The catheter was replaced and a valve changed to a high pressure with an anti-siphon device. This outcome was so unexpected, it challenged my understanding of what hydrocephalus actually was. I was determined to figure this out. Decades later, with the help of some brilliant engineers, it is now understandable and leads to the concepts that will be seen in this presentation. What's happening? There are no conflicts of interest uh, related to this presentation. The Hydrocephalus Clinic in Cleveland cared for a large contract, cadre of children and grown-ups who had been treated in infancy or childhood and remained in the clinic from inf infancy into adulthood. A substantial percentage of these patients were seen with severe headaches that often prevented them from attending school or interfered with their general lives in general. It is obvious that the definition that we use to define the slit ventricle syndrome at that point is now out of date. Almost no one palpates the valvular mechanism anymore. A PubMed search for slit ventricle syndrome resulted in 195 references Review of this literature revealed that all of them related to shunted patients with severe headaches. There was no consensus on the role of ICP or pathogenesis in these headaches. There remains significant skepticism as to whether there is a slit ventricle syndrome at all. A number of pa papers uh, specify that they are talking about a true slit ventricle syndrome, not further discussed. I think we need to have a consensus related to the definition of this often used title that relates to ICP and pathogenesis. Headaches are common in the general population, but in patients with shunts, it is significantly more common. There is always the possibility that the shunt has failed and that the patient would be in danger. In patients with intractable headaches and a shunt, the diagnosis is often uncertain. A few of these patients will, will require an actual ICP measurement to make a diagnosis. Experience with ICP, ICP monitoring of patients with intractable headaches and shunts resulted in five distinct conditions um, leading to this classification. Conditions one and two relate to overdrainage, which will be discussed by Professor Lazarus. Number five has been called shunt migraine. Generally, these patients have family histories of migraine, and when there are no issues of intracranial pressure, they are managed by neurology. Clar clarifying the condition by actually knowing the ICP results in reassurance to the patient, family, and the tr treatment team less need for imaging and fewer visits to the emergency room. Conditions three and four are relatively rare, but are dangerous for the patient and challenging to understand and may be difficult to treat. 
In order to understand the slit ventricle syndrome, regardless of which of the subtypes is being discussed, it is important to understand why there is or is not a change in the size of the ventricle related to the headaches. If the pressure in the ventricle is higher than the space on the outside of the brain, the ventricles will distend. If the skull is a fixed volume, a high pressure in the ventricle will lower with a lower pressure in the cortical subarachnoid space will re result in expansion of the ventricle. There will be less CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space as a result, which is not obvious on imaging. Of the skull, if the skull is distensible, such as in infants and par uh, particularly premature babies, the pressure outside the brain relates to the atmospheric pressure. In this case, Head can, the head can increase in volume either in the ventricles with obstruction or um, also in the cortical subarachnoid space if the cause is increased venous pressure in the dural venous sinuses. There will be an increase in head circumference. With these changes in the intracranial CSF volume of the brain does not change regardless of what happens to the head circumference, the volume of, of the CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space is rarely mentioned in radiology reports, but plays a major role in the changes in the ventricular volume. Increase in the venous pressures leads to pseudotumor in a fixed skull, but can cause hydrocephalus in a distens distensible calvarium. Types three and four of the classification related um, due to the cause being increase in the venous pressure. Unless the shunt is placed for placed specifically for pseudotumor, it must have been treating hydrocephalus with enlarged ventricles. It is likely that all of the patients who have increased in intracranial pressure without ventricular megaly must have had a transmental pressure difference differential with a higher pressure in the cortical subarachnoid space than in the ventricle. Because the brain is distensible, the difference must be there is, it is not very large um, and not large enough to be able to be pressure measurement uh, avail with available transducers. The ventricular catheter will drain until the brain collapse around it. Almost certainly the initial cause of the hydrocephalus in these patients began and was treated in infancy. This makes the age at the time of the shunt placement a critical piece of the history. The most common conditions that lead to this problem include Chiari malformations one and two, achondroplasia and craniofacial syndromes such as Cruzans and Pfeiffer syndrome. This video relates to what happens in infants in general and premature babies in particular, where venous hypertension causes the, pro the problem with terminal absorption of CSF. High venous pressure, hmm. high venous pressure results in distension of the ventricles and the cortical subarachnoid space. The skull expands and the head circumference increases. Drainage of CSF of premature babies by drain or shunt leads to a decrease in the head circumference as well as the ventricles. In older babies where there is more calvarial bone, the ventricles decrease, but the skull does not implode. At this point, the head circumference remains the same until the brain grows, growth displaces the CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space. Ossification of the calvarium derives from the, descent, from the distension of what has been called the neurocranial capsule, meaning that the distension of the dura defines the thickness and the shape of the calvarium. In this situation, there is significant uh, thickening of the calvarium and ossification across the fontanelles and sutures due to the temporary lack of distensible force.
Shunting in a baby whose head has expanded due to hydrocephalus tempor temporarily results in an absence of an outward pressure. This leads to a temporary stop in the increase in the head circumference and inward thickening of the calvarium. From the time that the shunt is placed to the time when the brain has increased in volume sufficiently to create an outward pressure of the dura on the calvarium, the calvarium will thicken. The sutures will close. Please note that with increase in brain volume, there can still be a delayed distension of the calvarium up to approximately age 10. In this mind uh, experiment of ge solid geometry, the brain volume in white is unchanged as the volume of the CSF in yellow. The only thing that happens is that the increase in the size of the ventricles leads to a decrease in the volume of the cortical subarachnoid space, which may not be recognized on CT due to the bone and is unlikely to be discussed on radiology reports in imaging unless it is specifically looked for. Note the obvious change in the ventricle. The volume of the sphere is two, three, uh, two thirds pi r cubed, and therefore the center volume will seem much bigger than the cortical subarachnoid space, um, which is uh, th not thick, but bigger, but smaller. Normal volume hydrocephalus is a term I first heard in a, in a presentation by Peter Carmel. The concept blew my mind. What did it mean? I hope that we will be able to come to a consensus that the term slit ventricle syndrome be, be limited to severe headaches due to increase in intracranial pressure in shunted patients with no increase in the volume of the ventricle. Uniquely in the case of patients with craniofacial syndromes, such as Cruzon's and Pfeiffer syndromes, it is likely that cephalocranial uh, disproportion may be part of the problem and a cranial expansion could be necessary for treatment. In these conditions, the sutures continue to fuse prior to full growth of the brain. And the calvarium is not thickened in the same way that it is in other children. Most, if not all of these patients have an expansion of the ventricles with the first cranial uh, surgery as the skull is now distensible as shown on the image in the middle. A shunt placed at this time leads to decompression of the ventricles. Shunting will then lead to a pressure differential causing the ventricle collapse. As opposed to the majority of the patients with slip ventricle sy syndrome, it is likely that the calvarium will, uh, in, it is less likely that the calvarium will increase after full growth of the brain. Please note that the cause of the hydrocephalus in the case of craniofacial syndromes relates to stenosis of the jugular foramina. That is the same it is true in uh, achondroplasia. In assessing patients for slit ventricle syndrome, it is essential to look to the age at the time of the first shunt, since the vast majority and possibly all of these patients will have been shunted in first in infancy. It is especially likely to occur in patients with congenital issues such as achondroplasia, Chiari 2 and craniofacial syndromes. The workup of the patient with uh, intractable headaches and a shunt begins with the history and a great deal of emphasis on that on the age at the first shunt. Someone should take the time to listen to and ponder the history and the problems that the patient presents with and give it credence. In a presentation uh, by Jerry Oakes from the University of Arizona, uh, Alabama, he analyzed the mortality rate uh, in shunt dependency and how it had plummeted following the advent of the nurse practitioner role uh, related to listening and to educating the families. Sometimes a headache diary will lead to insight. For the severe cases, uh, a fundoscopic examination by ophthalmology often leads to an answer. Personally, in patients with severe problems, I still re rely on actual measurements of ICP, first by a shunt tap and in complicated cases on the placement of a sensor. Working with a competent and caring nurse practitioner over 20, 20 years, 
with uh, needing answers, neither of us could remember a case of an in infection due to tapping. It is definitely possible that an infection may occur, but it happens very rarely when it is done carefully. The most complicated patients, and it is necessary to, sometimes to insert a transducer. While there are some tests that can be determined changes in ICP, not, um, we await the availability of non-invasive uh, me measurements of ICP. In the meantime, we still believe in the shunt tab. This example for, under, for the understanding of the, uh, the concepts and the condition. This MRI relates to an infant uh, with achondroplasia with irritability and bulging fontanelle showing ventricular dilatation and subarachnoid dilatation as well, as well as a rapidly expanding uh, calvarium and a bulging fontanelle. Uh, at that time, uh, a shunt was placed and the uh, this, uh, definition of achondroplasia was made. Her subsequent history is complicated, but at the age of 19, she presented with this scan with severe headaches, papilledema, and visual loss. ICP at the time of the monitoring showed a pressure of 75 millimeters of mercury. Please notice the presence of an open cistern and presence of CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space. It is essential to look for this in deciding what treatments to give. This problem does not relate to cephalocranial disproportion. At this point, she underwent a ventricle to cortical subarachnoid space to, um, uh, to, to, vent, to uh, per, uh, peritoneum. Um, the, the ventricular catheter and the subarachnoid catheter were spliced together above the valve. This is very important since if you, if you have two separate val valves in two separate places, uh, one of them will not be working because uh, one will always be higher or lower than the other. She's now doing great after two years and is back working and is um, uh, ready to get married. The goal of treatment of severe slit ventricle syndrome or true slit ventricle syndrome relates to preventing the transmantle pressure gr gradient between the ventricle and the low pressure due to the shunt and the cortical subarachnoid space due to the high venous pressure. If there is no blockage between the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space, the best treatment would be the use of a valved lumboperitoneal shunt, as it will drain both the ventricles and the cortical subarachnoid space at the same pressure. Unfortunately, a significant number of patients with this condition will not be ca candidates for this procedure due to being a chondroplastic or have carry, carry two malformation. In this case, it is necessary to uh, balance the pressure in the two compartments by shunting both ventricles and the cortical subarachnoid space spliced together proximally. It is essentially, it is essential about that this be done. Um, if there are two independent valves, only one, the lowest pressure valve, will stay open and will result in the hated transmental pressure gradient. This example is uh, this is the the paper on this this weird shunt uh, that has led us in good standing with uh, spina bifida patients and with achondroplastic dwarfs and patients with any kind of uh, Chiari malformation. Again, based on Newtonian physics, increase. Uh, Increasing the volume of the calvarium will lead to a decrease in the intracranial pressure, as shown by Tony Marmoreau in his thesis and writings related to the pressure, pressure volume index. Subtemporal decompression was the only option for treatment of pseudotumor prior to the development of the shunt. Work of Fred Epstein and Leland Albright showed that the sutures in patients with the slit ventricle syndrome often are uh, fused. Um, I would say that rather than being 
the calvarium being too small, it is very likely that the problem relates to venous pressure as it is in pseudotumor. Unless it is possible to lower the dural venous sinus pressures, the patients will always need a shunt in any case. It would be best to deal with, uh, with it with a different kind of shunt rather than a cranial expansion. In conclusion, shunt failure with severe headaches and no change in the ventricular volume, but extremely high and possibly lethal intracranial pressure should be uh, should define the slit ventricle syndrome. This condition is denied by many. In most severe forms, the result could be blindness or even death. Most and possibly all were shunted first in infancy. The problem relates to a transmental pressure gradient with a CSF pressure being higher than that in the ventricle. The treatment is to relieve the transmental pressure difference. Uh, what's the, 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 the take home message? The term slit ventricle syndrome should be limited to the condition of the shunted patient with increased intracranial pressure and no ventricular megaly. My goal is to overcome the skepticism uh, that occurs related to this um, um, problem. Uh, many, many um, neurosurgeons do not believe that this could happen, just like I couldn't in 1974. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Professor Rokit. My pleasure. Uh, there are a few questions uh, which have come up. Uh, uh, Nelsi is asking that, uh, have you seen a progressive decrease in the number of cases with uh, use of adjustable valves? No, I, I haven't uh, been taking care of uh, hydrocephalus since my retirement, but, uh, and it's very hard to, to, to say that. I think that the discussion of the, um, um, of the anti-siphon device is gonna be very important and I look forward to it. Um, but I, I think, that um, that's the most important part of it is to prevent, uh, prevent um, and I think that the use of, routine use of um, any siphon devices of any type um, has, will result or has resulted in a, a lesser lessening of this. What ends up happening is though, that patients with achondroplasia and patients with uh, Chiari II malformations uh, are still at high risk for having this condition. Uh, I think we'll get answers as we go along with other talks and uh, maybe we can come back to this question afterwards. Suhas uh, uh, from South India, he, he's come out with his own experience that since they started using Metronic shunts, uh, they have not had a single slit ventricle patient in last 10 years. I don't know what is the exact number. So maybe he can uh, talk a little later about his comments. Uh, the other questions which have been asked is that uh, if subtemporal decompression does not work, would you consider using LP shunt or what currently is your advice for LP shunts? Well, two things about LP shunts. They, they're perfect for patients who have con true communicating hydrocephalus, which means the CSF in the ventricle and the CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space are in communication then lumboperitoneal shunts will prevent the, chain, the brain from changing in any way. And as long as you have a, a, a valvular mechanism in it, it will, it will drain the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space together. Uh, if they're blocked, then it's gonna create a Chiari. It, so that you have, to, you have to be able to, you have to know that maybe a, maybe a study um, um, that shows that there's free flow between the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space or something. It's, it's, it's really, really a good treatment for patients um, uh, with this con condition if the CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space. Now, the thing that I've never tested would be what if you do um, a, a third ventriculostomy or thing? There, each patient has to be looked at 
separately. I, I do did a lot of lumbar uh, shunts, and so did David Frim um, on slit ventricle syndromes. You, it, the one of the take home messages is that don't leave the ventricular catheter working. You have to be able to show that the patient will be able to live with the lumboperitoneal shunt, because if you have a, a ventricle shunt too, you're you're demanding that there be a transmantle pressure difference, and it's very dangerous. <clears throat> so you have to prove that it's um, it's um, there's a free flow between the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space. In that situation, it's the perfect answer. What do you think is the upper age? Is there an upper age limit to doing a LP shunt in such situations? Is there what? Upper age limit? No, no, I don't think so. I think the, that um, in Japan, all NP, NPH is essentially done with um, with the lumboperitoneal shunts. I don't think that um, that things change uh, very much. I think that the elderly do well with lumboperitoneal shunts and so do young children. Dr. Satish is uh, here with us. Uh, he's going to speak in a, uh, uh, a few minutes, but he has a question he can ask himself, I suppose, about the transmural pressure. Uh, thank you for that great talk, Dr. Riket, and good to see you again. Um, I wondered, what is the actual normal transmantle pressure between the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space? Great question. And that's the problem. The, because the brain is distensible, as soon as there's a pressure differential, the brain will move towards that. So uh, it, it, it has to be there by physics. And there are, there, there, it's probably, um, you know, the, the pressure difference is probably, um, if it's 10 centimeters of, of, of water or five, five millimeters of mercury, it's gonna be one one hundredth of that. So you cannot measure it with, with, the, with the equipment we have. Now, it is sh shown in, um, in, in the laboratory that if you create hydrocephalus, you'll watch a, 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 a transmantle pressure that's, that's measurable until the brain gets to its maximum to the ventricles get to their maximum uh, maximum size, and then it's no longer measurable, and that's that's the thing. But by by the laws of physics, it has to be there. One of the things I have uh, been worried about is that if I know you are a great advocate for lumboperitoneal shunts, and uh, we frequently see <clears throat> acquired Chiari after that, which could add to the issue of uh, headaches in these uh, children. Uh, do you use a uh, sort of anti-siphon valve with the uh, lumboperitoneal shunt or uh, adjustable valve, or what do you recommend? Both. I, 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 I use the, um, the um, Codman um, valve um, that has, uh, which is programmable, and it has an uh, a, 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 a siphoning device part as part of that valve. I take a regular lumboperitoneal shunt catheter and put it in, and they have a um, connector that has a small end on one side and a larger end on another side. And on the out, when we get it out, I put it into the um, um, them together. So that it has a, it's a valve that is um, programmable, and um, and has an anti-siphon device on it. Yes, if you don't have an anti-siphon device on that, you're going to have intractable headaches, and that's really really um, important. That means that the pressure is too low, and um, in an older person, you do that, you're going to have subdurals and all of that. So there has to be. Um, uh, there has to be a, both a valve, in, they're just a, a, the, the, an LP shunt that you use up the out of the box is going to be a terrible thing. Uh, Naren, uh, you would like to make any comments before we go to Dr. Lazare? Um, no, I think we can come to further discussions. And if there's more questions for Dr. Riket, if you could please put it on the chat box 
and uh, if Dr. Riket can please kindly uh, answer them, that will be great. Um, so we can go to Dr. Lazarov. Uh, thank you, Prof. Thanks, thank you. Halep, once again. And uh, we now move to uh, the second talk uh, about the various concepts. And I'm sure, are we talking about the same disease or several different disease, or uh, are we just discussing different causation? Uh, I am very happy, uh, though I have not personally met Dr. Lazarit, uh, he is uh, at the UCLA and uh, he has also published uh, about uh, the concepts and uh, some meta-analysis uh, apart from his original work. Uh, so looking forward to this talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all. Good morning in the West Coast. Good afternoon for all of you in Europe. And uh, good morning to Dr. Rickett. I sincerely appreciate the invitation to talk today. And um, I feel like Halstead. Halstead, you know, the, the famous Viennese, Viennese surgeon, the one of the Halstead forceps. He was a very close friend of Brahms, or Johannes Brahms. And he was a good cello player, Halstead. But he refused to play the cello if Brahms was in the audience, in spite of the insistence from the Viennese Musical Society. So after to follow and knowing that Harold Rickett is in the audience and the other three or four, the other four panelists are in the audience, I should feel like Halstead and I should say I refuse to talk. I don't have the, in the, I withdrew from the clinical practice uh, six, seven years ago, and I don't have the wealth of the recent clinical experience that you have, <clears throat> and that certainly the audience will let the profit. So when presented with the, with the challenge uh, to talk about the concept of shunt over drainage, I went to what has been occupying my mind and my activity in the last five to six years, which is the epistemological analysis of what is that we know. Uh, in this uh, short time, I will not expand on the details of the, of the data accumulated, but I will work as ask uh, on the concept. So <clears throat> the way that we deal with any clinical case is deductive or inductive, deduction, induction, and those with some, um, with some, no, with a research-oriented um, interest, there is abduction, which is explained in the next uh, image. Um, in deduction, we go from the rule to the case to the result, and you can see there, uh, over drainage leads to switch lead ventricle syndrome, this child has switch ventricle syndrome, the CT and the MRI confirms that the switch ventricle syndrome. Induction starts from the child, continues to the MRI, and confirms the rule. And this is basically what we do every day, or most of the day, when faced with a challenging case or uh, curious about some outcome, we go to abduction. The, the abductive method ends in the child, ends in the particular patient. Over drainage leads to sweet ventricle, CT MRI confirms this child has sleep ventricle syndrome. And this is precisely what great minds do. And Dr. Rickett in his uh, the presentation mentioned who looks or who, that who looks after the, the child history or that is worth analyzing the child's history. And what is uh, abduction? And don't worry, I'm going to the concept of overdrainage. I need this preamble to go to that. Abduction is a uh, an explanatory reasoning that justifies an hypothesis. So you have the hypothesis that this child has split ventricle syndrome, the clinical 
and the radiological evidence shows that, confirms your, your assumption, but we, you, we, I did exactly the same. In my practice, I did the uh, temporal decompression, revised shunts, put LP shunts, upgraded uh, the, the, the valves. I'm not challenging the clinical approach, which I'm, what I'm saying is that when we see a child who has slit ventricle syndrome, clinically and radiologically, we assume it is over drainage. Over drainage <clears throat> explains, <clears throat> explains is the working hypothesis that we have. And the working hypothesis does we have to prove or we have to refute if needed. The uh, objective of my presentation is to show that or suggest that perhaps epistemologically we don't need to prove over drainage to believe in over drainage, although it's a strange concept. So Charles Stanford Pierce, the great American logician and philosopher, a polymath, true, he came with this concept of adaption and he says the surprising fact C is observed. <clears throat> and if the explanatory hypothesis is uh, correct, C will follow. Hence, there is reason to suspect the truth. So over drainage in cases of slit ventricle syndrome is proposed, is suspected, but is not necessarily proved. And what is over drainage? Over drainage. Um, for some time, I doubted the, the existence of over drainage in the absence of overproduction. I remember that uh, when I was very, uh, I mean, I was younger, that's, uh, that then I was more uh, um, vehement in my beliefs. Uh, we had a, a patient with a four ventricle choriplexus papilloma that had an external drain while we were waiting to take her to surgery. There was some potassium issues there. And uh, yes, that was over drainage. No matter what level we actually put the, um, we, we set the external ventricular drain, we could see that the child was over draining because there was an overproduction. And uh, the, the second reason made me doubt of the concept of overdrainage, not of slit ventricle syndrome, I'm talking about overdrainage, was precisely that, that, that it, I used for many years distal slit valves. And although the ventricles in those patients were collapsed or were close to be slit, the patients didn't have symptoms. Um, roughly the incidence of uh, slit ventricle syndrome is 1% or 2%. Preparing for this talk, I called, talked to one of my colleagues in uh, Nicaragua, a country where the high technology of shunts is not available many al surgical alternatives that we have are not available. And uh, Dr. Bosco Gonzalez Torres from uh, La Mascota Hospital in Managua, the children's hospital says that roughly looking at oh, 1,275 shunts, they use metronic middle pressure. They only had two patients with uh, the, the slint uh, ventricle syndrome. And that is the epistemologically what is over drainage. In, um, in 2014, around that time, with two then medical students, Stephanie Chork and Jason Chen, who now are about to graduate in residency program, in, one in Yale, another one at Mass General, we, we went with it uh, 
retrospective review following to the idea, trying to find the idea from where the, the, the concept of overdrainage came. No? Although there is some uh, contribution by uh, Dan, Di McNabb, Stenger, and Anderson, it was Becker around 1968, Donald Becker with Dr. Nelson, who said, who saw at a child with a slit ventricle syndrome, headaches, and they said, must be over drainage. I, again, I said, Dandy was the one who mentioned that thing. So we have this, this idea of a collapsed structure, and we come with the with concept of uh, there is over drainage. And that there is uh, no clear definition or no clear proof of overdrainage leads to the um, epistemological situation of underdetermination. Underdetermination is a is a big uh, matter of study in uh, philosophy of science and because at the heart of the under of the underdetermination of scientific theory by evidence is the simple um, idea that the evidence I'm able to ask at any given time may be insufficient to determine what beliefs we should hold in response to it. A textbook example is if all I know is that you spend 10 apples, 10, 10 dollars on apples and oranges, and the apples cost one dollar, while orange cost two dollars. Then I know that you did not buy six oranges because it will be twelve, right? But I do not know whether you purchased one orange and eight apples, two oranges and six apples, and so on. The, you have to agree in one moment that the data some information about initial conditions and rules and principles does not guarantee a unique solution. Uh, I could propose that overdrainage is due to underproduction. I mean, slit ventricle syndrome is due to underproduction of uh, cerebrospinal fluid. That the cori plexus has been damaged by the initial expansion of the ventricles and there is underproduction. Or Dr. Di Rocco in the conference before this symposium, he mentioned all the other sources of uh, cerebrospinal fluid production and absorption beyond the classical uh, choriplexus uh, arachnoid villi production and absorption. So when we look at the problem of, or at the concept of uh, overdrainage, we find that there is a strong element of underdetermination. And um, so then we are here working and you are doing, dealing with all your uh, uh, the clinical problems and the um, what we have is this question is it epistemologically correct to hold assumptions without empirical certainty and that problem was that that question was presented by plato in Tetus, Tetus. i don't know exactly how to pronounce it and uh, um, and led to the big question of American, American epistemology, which is the so-called Gettier problem. Is justified belief through knowledge? My justified belief that there is uh, over drainage, is it true knowledge? Is it absolutely true? Is justified? I am justified in believing that this child has over drainage or that is shanties over draining. But is it that true knowledge? Is the child really over draining? Uh, contemporarily, 
because I believe in over drainage, shall I say. And uh, I believe I, I intuitively have the justified belief of over drainage, but is it we as a neurosurgeon, physicians, we are, can we play the game also of the um, issues and philosophy of science as such as physics and quantum physics and uh, other of the so-called hard sciences do. No? I, I think that the medicine is informed by science, but is guided by reason and motivated by compassion. So how can we introduce our concepts? How can I uh, justify my belief in our drainage without having empirical knowledge that indeed this shant is over drainage? I have the uh, secondary knowledge because the, the, the ventricles are at the collapse. No? So uh, I go to Ludwig Wittgenstein, the great British, British Austrian, but he worked in England, philosopher. And uh, Wittgenstein is one of the giants of the uh, 20th century philosophy, one of the pillars of analytical uh, philosophy. And um, so it's not a, any minor player, or he wasn't, was not a minor player. And uh, through Wittgenstein, we find this, this problem of the concept of overdrainage and how we assume it. No? Um, for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with this word, any, any um, biographical sketch on him are, uh, are worth reading. was a very colorful character, was very humble, he lived humbly all his life, produced two books, one only, only one published in his life, the rest after his death in 1958, when he was 62 years old. And in spite of that, it's an enormous influence. And he um, was a, a very nice man also. And my favorite story, one of my favorite stories about uh, Wittgenstein, being nice and being bright um, is that when he returned to Cambridge after the First World War, where he served in the Austrian army, uh, Keynes, Keynes, the philosopher ten economist, the Keynesian economy, saw him in the train from London to uh, the Cambridge. And um, he said to his wife, uh, he wrote to his wife, God has arrived. I met him on the 515 train. Anyway, so this giant of the analytical philosophy has some hints on epistemology. In the philosophical investigations, the, the first paragraph of, of that book is, 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 is um, uh, he reproduces one text of San Augustine Confessions, where San Augustine says, how things are named. No, this is an apple, this is a chair, this is over drainage. How we name things is the process of naming things. No? And uh, in the philosophical, he says, one cannot guess how a word functions one has to look at this application and learn from that. By the way, over drainage is not a, a word in the English, at least in the English dictionaries, it's for all down. Over drainage are separate. I mean, I'm writing it as the other authors do as a single word, and I'm sure that your autocorrect starts underlining it in red. So how the word function is how the concept function over drainage, two words together. One has to look at this application and learn from that. You know? And he says, I said the breakup by connecting a rod and lever separately from its support is not even a lever. It may be anything or nothing. Children that we operate 
and they come with a slit ventricle, but without any of the, the symptoms, symptoms, they may have overdrainage, but we don't consider they have overdrainage. How we approach and, and think about. It. So overdrainage is not a definition, it's a statement. Uh, it's not a word. So, well, how far can we go back and analyze uh, the statement? What I tried to do with uh, Stephanie Chow and Jason Chen back in 2014 or 15, 13, 13, 14, we published in, in 14, it was try to analyze the, the, the statement. How how back can I go? No, how far back can I go in order to understand the mechanism of a statement? And um, just to uh, the comment on my admiration for for the Dante, I say that in the uh, I bring this again together that in the paradise, paradise in uh, purgatory third the canto uh, dante is in fear because he doesn't see virgil shadow next to him and so he thinks that virgil abandoned him in the shores of the purgatory in front of a huge mountain and uh, so Virgil explains to Dante that uh, he doesn't have a body. He, Virgil, doesn't have a body anymore. He's at the spirit. Thus, his presence does not cast a shadow on the ground. And Dante starts asking, and why, and why, and why? Of course, in very poetic language. And uh, Virgil say, say, says, um, be happy. Um, confine yourself, all humans, to the, to the Kia. And the Kia is one of the categories that uh, Aristotle uses in the Analytica, in which you, we find the cause through the effect. We, we look at the effect, we look at the slit ventricle, and we think of the overdrainage. And the other system, supposedly more perfect, is the propter quad, amazingly thin. We are using Latin words for the work of a Greek thinker, but that's how we are used. The, the, the propter quad is knowing that the cause, and from the cause, you infer the effect. In cases of overdrainage, we are looking at the effect. We are, we are as Virgil says, confine yourselves of humans to the quia. We are looking at the effect, and we are guessing that is the overdrainage. The ideal thing or in medicine, we always want to know the cause and from the cause determine the effect. We, know we want to know what causes cancer or what was the molecular mechanism for the cancer production. And from there, we, we guess what type of cancer we have, but we are looking backwards. We look uh, backwards in, the, in, in medicine. So statement and concepts, how far back we go to unravel the mechanism from the effects of um, slit ventricle syndrome, we presume that this cause is of a drainage. And here comes Wittgenstein. And again, I apologize if I'm boring you. I know that my talk is out of, <laughs> out of, um, the usual frame of the pediatric neurosurgery conferences, but I strongly believe that um, you will profit from it. So what Wittgenstein, one of the greatest uh, philosophers of uh, the 20th century, if not of one of the, in the, in the pantheon of the, the philosopher, has to tell us about overdrainage. And what he tells us about our drainage, he comes with the uh, hinge, the hypothesis of the hinge. And the hypothesis of the hinge, you will understand better, says all testing, all confirmation and disconfirmation of an hypothesis take place within a system of assumptions. 
I am replacing the valves, I am doing this, which is successful otherwise, no? I mean, doctors, you, we, we wouldn't keep on doing this if this would not be successful, right? Upgrading the valve, putting the, the TLP shunts, and some of the subtemporal DA decompression. So we have the, the assumption. But the and Wittgenstein on uncertainty, which is a collection of his notes, he says, the question that we raise and our doubts depend on the fact that some propositions are as if it were like hinges on which those turn. If I want the door to turn, the hinges must stay put. And hinges are, according to Wittgenstein, according to modern epistemology, is a <clears throat> it's not an it's not an empirical proposition. It's not a, it's a proposition of uh, this is a large ventricle. This is the consequence of over drainage. It's not empirical. And <clears throat> so the hinge epistemology uh, holds that there is a class of commitments, hinge commitments, which play a fundamental role in the structure of belief and rational evaluation. They are the most basic general presuppositions of our worldviews, which make it possible for us to evaluate certain beliefs or doubts as rational. This is a work, as you, as you can see, from 2020, from last year. We are the hinge epistemology for which we may profit through our understanding of the concept of overdrainage is a contemporary matter in epistemology again. So <clears throat> re, re uh, the capitulating, the, one cannot guess how a word function, one has to look at its application and learn from that. I set the brake and connected all the levers <clears throat> and over, over drainage is a hinge to open the door to SVS. In other words, is for years in the past, I tried to find the explanation of over drainage to, um, in general, and apply to slit ventricle syndrome. <clears throat> I tried to find the who wrote it, the mechanism. I, I tried to go through a theoretical understanding of the concept of overdrainage. And then as Virgil says to Dante, I mean, be happy with the choir. And the concept of overdrainage will help you like hinges in the door to open the door into other things, like saying it is okay to um, uh, not have a full understanding of the principle or of uh, the mechanism. And it is reasonable to start working solution <clears throat> based on the assumption. I'm sure that one day we will have the technological tools to actually prove that there was over drainage or proof that there is no over drainage by under production or proof that is actual the brain parenchyma that squeezes into the ventricular wall and gives that image. But so far, for the moment, we have what we have <clears throat> and we work as we work and it is a reasonable thing. Uh, <clears throat> two more slides and I stop boring you. Willard Van Horman Quine, great, um, American philosopher and Pierre Duhem, amazing French physicist. They came with a Duhem Quine thesis, which is a thesis very, very strong and very well held by the epistemological community that says any empirical taste requires background assumptions. And this is precisely what Harold talked when he said we need to look at the, at the child, at that particular child, which is precisely what Pierce says, when you, we have a bad action, we go from the rule to the result to the case, 
which is the background assumption. What was the origin of the hydrocephalus? What was the pressure? What was the delay between diagnosis and shunting? Were there any um, shunt obstruction episodes? How many of those were? What was the nature of those, of those shunt obstructions? So the empirical test of whether a slit ventricle syndrome is properly treated through a shunt revision or whatever procedure is based on the background as has to include the background assumptions and the background assumptions of oil drainage are only given by the patient. A paper from 2021. So out of the of the, the press, the Wittgenstein hinge epistemology is uh, very much involved now. And I think that I share with you my belief, I share adequately my belief that hinge epistemology is useful for understanding the concept of um, over drainage, a concept that we don't need to prove, a concept that is there, a concept that is an hinge, and we have to be happy with the choir. Thank you. Dr. Uh, <clears throat> that was a philosophical uh, uh, <clears throat> twist to this whole uh, problem, and the arguments are very strong. <clears throat> when I was discussing with Naren, <clears throat> I did mention to him that the problem does not seem to be as common as I saw when I was training in uh, UK. Uh, several years ago <clears throat> and uh, most of us are still putting uh, fixed pressure valves because many patients can't afford it. The other interesting feature I find, uh, again, I don't think there is any epidemiological or any other kind of study, is that it seems to be much less common in public hospitals than private uh, clinics. So I, I really do not know uh, I have any definite explanation for this or does it show any kind of trend? But it's interesting to listen to your hypothesis. And uh, there are several questions on this. Many of them you can probably answer in the box, but uh, most of them are uh, on the same issue that uh, does it really exist? Are you really <clears throat> trying to tell us that it probably does not exist? Uh, Maybe you could comment or any other panelist could comment. Yeah. <clears throat> they, and I, I see MC14 is asking, was it a joke? I mean, good. That's Correct. I mean, that, that I amuse you in the I morning. I use those words. Happy. <laughs> in the morning or in the evening. Uh, the, um, yes, the, um, the thing is um, uh, that the existence or not for for a long time for a long time i was obsessed with the idea of proving the existence of, of proving the mechanism per se no the, but then i see that maybe we are chasing the uh, the wrong rabbit in trying to prove the existence or not and precisely i didn't expand a lot in my work that when with with my colleagues from Central America, mostly in Panama, Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, and El Salvador, I see that slit ventricles, as, exactly as as you said, uh, the border, are less common in um, public hospitals than in private hospitals. I had my good share at UCLA of uh, patients with slit ventricle syndrome, as you did, and uh, or as you do now, and yes, there is a I would not call class different. No, no, but yes, it, it is a valid observation that I I agree with that. No, 
And the explanation of the over drainage also dominates my college in Central America. Dr. Bosco, when he when he told me that he had to only two patients of 1,275 shunts, he says, yes, but one of them was because I did a, a third ventriculostomy and opened a very wide window. Thus, there was over drainage. No? So over drainage dominates our, our understanding, no? Thanks. And Great. some Julius says, what is the, 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 the hinge? Uh, the hinge is over drainage. We are using an assumption that has not been proven, but is useful for us to open the door. So over drainage doesn't have to be necessarily proven. We don't have to work on proving that over drainage, we have to solve the understanding the disease as a such, you know? What Dr. Rickett and and um, you said now that uh, the, the patient, what is in in the patient that defines the slit ventricle syndrome? No. Okay. Uh, can I just uh, ask, uh, uh, Professor Diapujari? I know this is philosophical, but it's important because, in the sense that I'm sure we all have had this, we put the same valve on the same kind of neonates, and in one patient the ventricle is um, uh, large in one it's very small and uh, it's the same valve that we have used it's the same way that i have done it every time then why one uh, within six or 12 months is uh, small um, uh, i think uh, prof uh, prof um, lazarov um, is asking a fundamental question i think it's important to address it uh, um, or even think about it because sometimes otherwise we uh, we sometimes journey in our own assumptions. Maybe, maybe our assumptions are right, but maybe that uh, we have to ask it. Uh, Dr. Riket, I know, uh, can you make any comments? Uh, um, Dr. Suhas, my younger colleague, he is he's, uh, trying to say that it is real and uh, he may have something to say, I think, if you give him a chance later. Sure, I'll do that. Uh, if... Uh, Dr. Did you ask me a question? Yes. That I should, um, I, the, it's the patient's fault. Um, it's, it's, it is, um, at the end of the day, the, the, uh, what, how are you going to develop a, a pressure difference? So um, the more, it, the higher the pressure is in the cortical subarachnoid space will dep de depend on how quickly the brain uh, get smaller or the ventricles get get smaller so it's a matter it's a really quite easy um to understand the once you know that the size of the ventricle and the size of the cortical subarachnoid space depend on how the how different the pressure is from one to the other and the uh, the, the the if you can't the best thing to do is to make them the same or at least to to uh, have full uh, the ability to have the same pressure in the cortical subarachnoid space space and the um, in the ventricle, and the same it, it depends on if you have a, the same valve, but the pressure in the, the general pressure in the cortical subarachnoid space probably related to the venous pressure um, in the dural venous sinuses. Uh, if, 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 the, if the pressure is uh, higher in the dural venous sinuses and you put a shunt, shunt in at, at, a, at, a, at a specific valvular, then the ventricles will get smaller, faster, and maybe stay the same than if you have lower pressures in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cortical subarachnoid space has to get rid of some spinal fluid as well. Um, so it's, it's really just um, an equation that you should be able to, to use. So you can't, you don't have the pressure and it, it, it would be easier as an in, as a experiment to see what happens when you, if you change the, the dural venous sinus pressures um, to uh, how fast the ventricles come down or what the end, end, end is, so it's not un, it's not unexpected that two patients, um, because they're different, would have different expect what what would happen with a specific valve, 
would be the same, but it would be different in the two patients. That's great. So I hope I answered that uh, question. It's absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Professor Dio Pujari, um, thank you very much uh, for sharing. And uh, Dr. Professor Lazarov, once again, thanks for the very thoughtful and important, raising the important question thank you uh, that we thank need for the to... invitation and thank you for the chance to to say hello to to the harold and see how youthful and full of energy he is <laughs> that he's ever youthful so yeah, thank you very much uh, so the ne the next chair is uh, mr dr amedio calisto he's a consultant pediatric neurosurgeon and the clinical lead for pediatric neurosurgery at Oxford. He had trained in neurosurgery in Italy. Then he did a fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery in Glasgow and in um, older hair in Liverpool. Um, so it's a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Calisto to chair the next two lectures. Thank you. Thanks, Naren. Hello, he hello everyone, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be with you and it's a privilege um, to be part of, of this very, very interesting webinar. And it's my privilege to introduce the next two speakers, very eminent ones. Um, we'll start from Professor Krishnamurthy, who does not need an introduction, but in case there was somebody new on, in neurosurgery and in hydrocephalus in particular, and he just said that he's professor of neurosurgery at the Cerny Upstate University in, in New York. He's not only a famous surgeon and, and a popular teacher, but he's a, he's a scientist whose publications span from basic science like macromolecular clearance and efflux uh, transporters to post-traumatic hydrocephalus, neonatal neonatal hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus as well. And if this wasn't enough, uh, we have also um, long um, hydrocephalus in long-term space flights. I, I can't imagine anything more uh, uh, encompassing than, than, than this. So um, we're going to tap into that uh, wealth of knowledge um, to uh, benefit to understand how we can stay away from a slit ventricle syndrome. So Professor Krishnamurthy, please feel free to start whenever you are ready. I will keep an eye on the chat box and I will mute myself from now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Callisto, for that really nice introduction. And thank you, Narain, for arranging this slit ventricular syndrome conference. Um, I'm privileged to present our work uh, with uh, this esteemed audience, I see who's who on hydrocephalus um, in the audience. Uh, uh, I just want to acknowledge one of my residents who helped me with part of my presentation, George Kutsuras, who's interested in pediatric neurosurgery. My topic that Noreen gave me is a very interesting one, avoidance of slit ventricular syndrome. As you can see, there's been sufficient controversy about what is slit ventricle syndrome. Uh, just want to mention my conflicts of interest before I go on with the talk. Uh, we got funding from the Department of Defense as a Discovery Award last year to work on efflux transporters, and I am biased. Um, I think um, that hydrocephalus can be treated at some time in the future without the need for shunts. So what do we know about SVS? It's very clear that most patients have a history of shunt placement in the first year of life. And if you have post-hemorrhagic or post-meningitic sources for hydrocephalus, those children are at higher risk. And it's been uh, shown that it's a complication of ventricular peritoneal shunt placement, and it's found in 4 to 37% of the patients, which feeds into a lot of different opinions about how many people get it. Is it public hospital, private hospital, this child, that child, uh, et cetera. And, and it's very clear that papers related to slit ventricle syndrome are all talking about different things. 
And I will come back to this topic a little bit later in my talk. I think the fundamental problem is we don't have a definition and we don't have a definition because we don't have a way to understand what happens with the shunt quantitatively. And then there is the acquired craniocerebral disproportion that's been shown uh, from shunting. So I'm gonna briefly talk about the use of shunts and use of other methods, but I'm gonna refrain from encroaching into what other professors are talking in this symposium, uh, because I think repetition is not necessary for this esteemed audience. Um, and I'm gonna take a detour into some of the work that we are doing uh, in avoidance of uh, shunt technology for hydrocephalus itself. With relation to shunts, it's very clear if you use a very low pressure valve during the shunt insertion for infant hydrocephalus, we get uh, secondary craniosynostosis and we start the process of craniocerebral disproportion. And low pressure valves have been associated with increased rate of malfunctions and higher likelihood of SVS. So one of the things that I do in my practice is to have frequent follow-up during the first year of life and subsequently to make sure that there is no suture overlap, no evidence of over drainage. And if there is some, then I upgrade the valve, um, whether it is higher high pressure valve or a, or a programmable valve, I, I upgrade it with or without anti-siphon device. Uh, the presence of subdural fluid collection is yet another reason to upgrade the valve because that clearly shows the brain is coming away from the skull surface and we need to upgrade it. Interestingly, it, it appears that a presence of normal brain parenchyma is necessary for the creation of slip ventricular syndrome. And it's known to be less common in patients who have loss of cerebral uh, volume uh, that results in cerebral palsy and uh, atrophy. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy has lower rates of over drainage and perhaps it works less well than a shunt. Um, there is, um, with the result that there is less chances of subdural hematoma, uh, slit ventricles, and secondary craniosynostosis. By, by, um, by saying that it works less well than a shunt, I mean the flow rates may per are perhaps much lower than a shunt draining the fluid from the ventricle to the peritoneum. And the problem with endoscopic third ventriculostomy is the higher initial mortality and higher initial failure rates. But once it is successful, it results in a better long-term success. This is one of the reasons why endoscopic third ventriculostomy has been reported by several authors as a treatment strategy for SVS. I want to uh, mention uh, a cautionary statement because public published literature uh, is from experts who have passed the learning curve for endo performing endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So one should take care to meet those rigorous standards in order to perform ETV with or without choroid plexus coagulation as a first procedure in infancy. Uh, the success rates are lower than uh, what is expected in a child over two years. And the most common cause of hydrocephalus is post-hemorrhagic. And 
one of the things that is known is to look at the cistern and if there is a scarring of the cistern where you're fenestrating the ventricle tube, um, that might help determine whether your ETV is going to be successful or not. It's frustrating to see that there are no quantitative methods to evaluate a shunt. I keep wondering whether the shunt is working or not, and I'm pretty sure most of you do, uh, because the last time we absolutely know whether the shunt is working well or not is when we inserted it and saw the fluid flowing or when we tap it. Currently, there exists no technology to determine how much, um, how much flow is occurring in the shunt and how, how that flow correlates with normal functioning. Ideally, shunt diversion of, of CSF should allow the brain to function normally and there are no symptoms. But we don't know what that flow would be because the thermal dilution methods that are now um, being popularized to check shunt function are qualitative. And the paper that we published on a shunt flow sensor were tested in external ventriculostomy drains and it is no longer available to test in a shunt because the company did not get funded. Despite all the technical advances in shunt technology and the widespread use of programmable valves and other technical advanced um, systems, we have no idea whether the shunts work all the time, some of the time, or not at all. And we don't know what happens with the dural venous pressure when, when we stand up and what happens with the shunt flow. What happens when the, sh uh, when the person is lying down and the venous pressure is high? Does the shunt work higher? We have no idea. You can compare this sort of technology to implantable cardiac defibrillator, which not only recognize as, recognizes a normal rhythm from an abnormal rhythm, but has the ability to convert an abnormal rhythm to a normal rhythm by defibrillation, or a responsive neural stimulators that we uh, implant for epilepsy. I'm going to quote one of our fellow speakers here, Professor Sinali. Um, he published this paper a long time ago, but I keep using his slides. One of the things that is impressive in this paper is that if you use the Omaya reservoir and tap regularly and you decrease the protein levels and the cell levels to down to a minimum. There are a few patients that won't need a shunt. And this was an inspiration for me to um, look at methods to decrease the burden of proteins and the hemorrhagic fluid in the CSF in order to uh, relieve hydrocephalus. I've had a few grateful uh, infants who have now grown up to be adults. We published our experimental work on how osmotic gradients are sufficient to result in hydrocephalus. And in this paper that I published with Dr. M Professor McAllister, we showed that there is evidence of hydrocephalus in this animal with just hyperosmolar dextran infused through a ventricular catheter and an osmotic pump that without any evidence of obstruction. Further, we showed that the degree of hydrocephalus, degree of hydrocephalus was proportional to the amount of dextrans infused in a subsequent paper. And while I talk about my experiments, this has been shown to be relevant to post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus in infancy. The biochemical, this paper was published by Dr. McAllister long after um, we were co-publishing uh, very recently, actually last year. Uh, 
uh, which shows, which investigated the CSF contents, both for osmolarity as well as total protein. And you can see in the graph on the right that the osmolarity of the CSF was much higher compared to the serum. Therefore, because the osmolarity is higher, the fluid obviously flows from the vasculature into the ventricles, resulting in hydrocephalus. In our experiments, we had shown that the dextran is cleared by the cells of the blood-brain barrier into the blood and out of, out of the brain. So you can see here, there is, there's a confocal microscopy where there's microglia are stained red, and this microglia is ex expelling the fluorescent, green fluorescent dextran out into the uh, small venule, and you can see the co-localization as a yellow uh, color. And you can see, if you look at the same Fitzy dextran label in the blood, it is peaking at about an hour, and a little later, there is a urine peak, showing that this, this process of getting from uh, the ventricle to the paravascular space into the blood and urine is a rapid process. So we asked the question, if macromolecules that are in the ventricle are responsible for fluid influx into the ventricles, then macromolecular transport should be delayed in hydrocephalus. To do this, we used a seven Tesla magnet and we had three different groups of animals. One group had hydrocephalus created through a kaolin injection into the basal cistern, that's the middle panel. And the uh, other group of hydrocephalic animals were created with a kaolin injection into the cisterna magna, that's called the obstructive model. And these were compared to normal, which is the top panel. In order to study this, we used a uh, ion tagged dextran into the ventricles, and we took four scans per minute and total 80 scans in 20 minutes to look at the uh, times taken to clear the ion tag dextran. And as you can see, you have the baseline and you have the injection peak and the half life for clearance of the ion dextran in a normal animal was seven minutes. And in both the, mo both the models of hydrocephalus, the half-life was 20 minutes, which is much longer. And we showed that if you do histopathology, these dextrans were stuck in the perivascular space. And these were published in our, um, in our paper in Brain Research a few years ago. So we came up with this efflux transport hypothesis. Efflux transporters are expressed in blood-brain barrier and efflux transporters are protective. They clear a wide variety of macromolecules from the brain. And the reason we looked at the efflux transporters was because HTX rat, which presents with hydrocephalus, was shown to be decreased, once shown to have decreased peak glycoprotein expression. So we asked the question, does peak glycoprotein expression determine the presence and degree of hydrocephalus? So we hypothesized that knockout of a peak glycoprotein should result in severe hydrocephalus, while overexpression should protect the rat from hydrocephalus. So we induced hydrocephalus by using intraventricular injection of autologous blood. And we had groups of PGP inhibited MDR1A knockout rats and PGP enhanced MRP2 knockout rats. And they were compared to control animals. Seven Tesla MRI was performed prior to surgical procedure to note whether there was hydrocephalus or not. 
five days, 10 days, 15 days after inducing hydrocephalus. And we also looked at the clearance half time, like I showed you before, at the end of the 15th day. Here were the, res here were the results. We looked at the baseline and we called that zero and normal animals were labeled, are labeled in blue, the MDR1A in orange and MRP2 in gray. MDR1A is the knockout animal without the pea glycoprotein and MRP2 is the overexpressed one. And you can see um, on the day 15, the M MDR1A knockout animal had, had much larger ventricles secondary to intraventricular hemorrhage induced hydrocephalus compared to MRP2 knockout, which overexpresses peak like a protein. These two were statistically different. Peak like a protein knockout had decreased rate of clearance and largest ventricular size. You can see that the first bar here is the normal animal without any hydrocephalus. And the second bar here is the, the nor normal animal with interventricular hemorrhage without any alteration of the genes. And the orange is the knockout with the peak like a protein that is not expressed. And the, the gray one is the peak like a protein enhanced animal. And you can see the T half clearance came down, ventricular size came down. So we concluded from these experiments that MRP2 knockout or P glycoprotein overexpression, although it does not completely prevent hydrocephalus, it shows that these efflux transporters are capable of removing excess, excess macromolecules from intraventricular hemorrhage and probably are key regulators. So we are looking at drugs that enhance the, these functions of the efflux, efflux transporters to treat hydrocephalus in the future. So in conclusion, slit ventricular syndrome is a consequence of shunt insertion in the first year of life. Post-hemorrhagic and post-infection hydrocephalus are risk factors. If you have to shunt, use a higher pressure or programmable valve and carefully monitor the infant. If you can perform ETV with or without CPC, it is better for the infant, but we need to take care to make sure our technique is better and, and case selection is better to minimize the risks. In post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, we need to make sure we optimize the number of ta taps through the OMI reservoir so that you can avoid the shunt in the minority. It may not make a big difference for the population, but it makes a huge difference for that infant not to have a shunt the rest of the life. And I'm confident that we are onto some new strategies to a hopefully a shunt-free society and therefore we, we won't need a seminar like this in the future. I'm grateful for uh, all these foundations which funded uh, my Department of Neurosurgery and my past chairman and the now dean, Dr. Chin, who supported me through much of my research. And you can see my um, papers uh, on that website, purehydrocephalus.me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof Professor Krishnamurthy, for this very interesting insights in the puzzle mechanism of such a complex phenomenon, such as hydrocephalus. Although I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried you will make us all unemployed in the future if a medical strategy is found. Um, 
we're keeping an eye on the on the chat box and Naran, thanks for helping me with that. Um, if I can ask you a question, you, you just touched on the possibility of finding some app regulators to, to, to increase the, um, uh, the, 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 the reabsorption of the CSF into the bloodstream. Are you able at this stage to um, mention some of these molecules or to give us a steer on what could possibly help? Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't think many of us would miss a shunt revision in the middle of the night. Um, so I'm hopeful that there'll not be a lot of people throwing rotten eggs at me. Um, the, the point about efflux transporters is that they exist already. So there are a lot of medications uh, that both block the efflux transporters like peak glycoprotein and enhance uh, efflux transporters like peak glycoprotein. Uh, one of the common blockers are erythromycin and some of the cancer drugs that are routine, routinely used. The other um, enhancers are rifampicin and corticosteroids. So uh, the, the, the interesting aspect of efflux transporter involvement in getting rid of the macromolecules out of the brain is that this becomes the, the ventricular uh, volume uh, changes depending on what you eat and what medications you are on. Uh, for example, if you ate two candy bars, uh, it's 50 grams of glucose, it'll increase the ventricular volume by 4%. And this was actually published. This is not our work. This was published way before we started looking into osmolarity. So the, the ventricular volume changes based on uh, a number of things. So it, it makes it for a lot more a confusing picture, if you will. Uh, and so the, the macromolecular infl influx and the content of the ventricular system also interacts with the pressure fluid dynamics uh, and intracranial compliance measures. So makes for a lot difficult time understanding what exactly is happening in a given, given cross-section of time. But uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, with the amount of uh, uh, researchers working on hydrocephalus, we'll be able to sort that out. So very interesting, very, very interesting. Um, I'm thinking um, when we are trying to compare two scans, trying to understand if there is a shunt malfunction in the middle of the night, we are going for a, a millimetric difference between the two. And actually there are so many things that can influence that size. We are trying to make a clever decision. Uh, yeah, but 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 if it's if it is larger, I don't think you should worry about the macromolecules. I think we should still <laughs> think about shunts. No, um, of course not. Shunt malfunction is real, so I, I don't want to I don't want to leave this audience by saying that uh, we can walk away. And and we got to be careful okay. with any new methods, including my own, uh, to be absolutely clear that it is proven beyond beyond any considerable doubt that it's going to work and not put my patient in harm. So. Yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Krishnamurti, there's a comment question from Dr. Harold Rickett. Did you want me to answer it myself? Uh, uh, sure. I, uh, I completely, completely agree with you that it's not a shunt, it's a sentence. Once you put a shunt in a baby, it, it'll change his life or her life forever. And it, if we could avoid any one shunt, we've made a whole big difference in their lives. Uh, it seems to me that we do way too many shunts in the, in the newborn period. And the data, especially um, w recent data, seems to show that it's, we should be looking more at the volume of the brain, of the brain itself rather than the ventricle. And, uh, just a mild degree or a moderate degree of, of ventricular megaly uh, does not necessarily mean that the patient won't do well. Uh, people have big heads sometimes. I, I think we should be much more um, 
careful about who we, we do and accept some ventricular megaly. And I think, I hope that you would agree with that. I just think that um, we were in the process of, of um, making problems that didn't need to be made. I, I, I cannot but agree with you, Professor Riquet. I think um, I, I take, um, I take great pride in that in that uh, there is more people doing endoscopic third ventricle ostomy and it's become much more of a commonplace. So um, the work of uh, Dr. Warf and others uh, here in the audience um, have helped us to do more third ventricle ostomies and that might go a long way in helping prevent a lot of the shunt related complications. Um, but I, but I do agree with you, it is a sentence. And I think um, there's not a soul in this audience that doesn't understand that. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Just a comment, if I may make, uh, Mr. Dr. Callisto. Um, I was also more conservative regarding putting shunts uh, because of the work of Dr. Uh, ben Wolf uh, uh, and colleagues on the volume of brain. But about four or five months ago, there was a paper that came in the Journal of, uh, uh, sorry, actually, in the, it was in Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics uh, uh, that um, earlier shunt in uh, uh, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus was associated with larger uh, hippocampus volume. And so nowadays, uh, in, certainly in Britain, uh, the neonatologists are keen for us to. Um, uh, address the ventricular megaly earlier. So this is a controversial area. Probably we will come to it on another meeting, but just to just to mention it while uh, we are at this. Thanks. And and just to just to piggyback on that, Narain, I think um, we have all seen uh, you know severe hydrocephalus when you shunt them after a few months or so, the brain volume actually increases. Mm -hmm. So uh, it may be a, a, a little bit of a presumption to just look at the volume of the brain, uh, some cases, I'm not saying all, but uh, some cases, clearly uh, Professor Riquet has a uh, lot more experience than I do, but um, I think it's important to understand that there's a dynamism to this whole uh, continuum of what is what's happening, and clearly shunting early or treating hydrocephalus early is most beneficial to the infant with hydrocephalus. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti. Uh, Mr. Kalisto, there's no other questions at the but, moment. Okay, then we can move to sure. the next speaker. Thank you very much. The next speaker is also a very eminent speaker, Professor Chinali. Um, who is um, Chair and Professor of Pediatric Neurosurgery in Naples, Italy, and Director of the Department of Neurosciences. He trained and worked in New York, in Paris, and in the UK as well, if I remember well, Professor Cialli. And he's a worldwide famous neurosurgeon who trained hundreds of neurosurgeons around the world, if I can say, because he's very much committed to training, very active in at least seven scientific societies. He's editor of three books and he's altered um, book chapters. And his last book on hydrocephalus, the second edition is from 2019. He's also founding member of the International Federation of Urine Endoscopy. And he uh, directs a course that is every year held in Naples, which is a, a, a must, a, a very well-known course for all pediatric neurosurgeons. So Professor Cinelli, welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. Please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank, thank you, Amadeo, for your very nice presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, very okay, well. Okay, fantastic. So I will uh, share the screen. Thank you very much to uh, Naren for uh, this uh, invitation. Although I try to resist, because uh, I told him that I have not a great experience in uh, um, slit ventricle syndrome. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can, yep. Okay, yes, fantastic. Yes, we can. 
but uh, I finally I was very happy to uh, participate. I am very grateful for this presentation and for his uh, everyday work and support uh, in the department to Pietro Spenato, who uh, helped me in uh, putting together the uh, very last literature and the, the uh, observation of the cases that we have seen in the last in the last 20 years. Uh, my main disclosure is that I have very little experience in slit ventricle syndrome. And uh, this is not a joke, uh, it is real. Uh, in my 100% uh, pediatric practice, uh, I operate approximately uh, six, my department operates approximately 600 cases a year over a 3 million recruitment area. And we have seen in the last 22 years, uh, five cases of uh, so-called real uh, slit ventricle syndrome. So it's really very, very small experience if compared to the uh, literature and to the uh, average experience of uh, all these, um, of most of the speakers. And uh, four of these patients were inherited by previous practice or referred from uh, other departments. And one of these patients was created by the shunt that was planted into um, uh, my department by my own colleagues. Uh, so it's, um, it's a very, very uh, small experience that I have. And I hope of not being uh, out, of the, out of the box in uh, talking about the, this syndrome that I really know, uh, don't know very well. I have never understood very well. And so I will, uh, I'm very thankful and grateful to the giants who came before me for being more clear, uh, especially to Harry Kate and uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, who really did very, very nice uh, presentation, and uh, also to Jorge Lazarev, who put some philosophy into this complex problem. It is a very, very complex problem. We are still discussing about a proper definition. Mainly the problem is an incredible variety of uh, pathophysiological theories from uh, cranial cerebral disproportion, gliosis of the ventricles, venous congestion, ventricular isolation, capillary absorption laziness, uh, pulsatile vector for shunt of a drainage, theory of the siphon effect. So this complex pathophysiological uh, philosophy and complex pathophysiological theory basically uh, has one only thing in common and it is a iatrogenic pathology. So there is no philosophy in that. It is the neurosurgeon who is the cause of the slit ventricle syndrome by implanting a shunt. It is by over drainage, it is by under drainage. Uh, we can uh, philosophy about that as much as you want, but we are responsible for that. And we have to keep that into account because we can really create, we can save the life of the child with our shunt, but we can really create a very, very bad disease and a very, very bad condition. The treatment reflects the variety of the pathophysiological theories. Basically, every theory has created its own treatment and uh, many of this treatment can be put together in order to uh, tailor the perfect algorithm of treatment that is individual for every single patient. So different strategies have been based on different pathophysiological theories, of course, and the step of treatment schemes with progressive application measure from the most basic to those with a higher risk is uh, at the origin uh, of the um, complex algorithm that has been proposed. Uh, all my practice was uh, cleared and uh, um, very nicely uh, organized by the uh, seminal paper of Harold Riquet and by the everyday advices of Christian Stentros, with whom I worked for 10 years in Paris and who has been my master in uh, everybody concerns, everything concerns at the But this paper and this early algorithm of treatment of uh, Harold Riquet was uh, uh, absolutely um, clear to me. And uh, we, uh, in a dis making the difference between the shunt malfunction with the normal ventricle or with small ventricle and the so-called real uh, slit ventricle syndrome. Uh, symptoms of shunt blockage with small ventricle, they are dangerous. It has been said very nicely. We can have severely sick uh, uh, the patients with the apparently normal ventricle and above all, without any increase in the um, uh, ventricular size if compared to the baseline uh, CT scan. So they are very difficult to recognize, but they are so sick that we immediately know what is going on. 
in this patient what to do. Uh, and it's a very, very pl practical talk. I will try to remain as practical as possible. Of course, first of all, we do nothing. That means we observe that it's not nothing, but it's very important not to harm the patient by the very, very first hours of observation, rushing to the OR because the patient is very sick. Trying to pound the valve and see what's going on, trying to understand what is going on. Possibly even downgrade opening pressure of the valve. And recently, we also start with the steroids that can be of some um, effectiveness in uh, taking time. Anti-migraine drugs, non-narcotic analgetics, uh, diuretics uh, can be helpful, but especially the steroids uh, were uh, um, proposed by the group of uh, Tel Aviv and the dexamethasone, in fact, is quite effective in taking some hours or some days before you understand what is going on and before rushing in doing surgery or unnecessary uh, shunt revisions that could be avoided by a simply less invasive uh, um, observation and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and maneuver. We observe three, six hours at least by amping on the valve. We use the steroids. If there is the resolution of symptoms that is relatively frequent, uh, this can be a temporary resolution, of course, but this gives time. And in this case, uh, we restart with the elective upgrade of the opening pressure of the valve at the higher uh, tolerated setting. Uh, we frequently uh, implant, uh, almost always implant a programmable valve in order to uh, try to have uh, uh, some um, weapon to use instead of uh, shunt revision, and uh, this can be effective in uh, some cases. If there is no resolution or recurrence of the symptoms, then of course you are obliged to revise the shunt if the patient is sick, if there is headache, or, of course. Uh, if there is papilledema, there is no, uh, of course, we, we have to revise the shunt immediately. So it's not the papilledema that is the, um, the leading cause of shunt revision. Mostly we have to revise the shunt because the patient is so sick that uh, we really have to do something and all the previous maneuvers simply don't work. Sometimes simply changing the position of the ventricular catheter using the neural navigation is uh, effective. Uh, navigation and the electromagnetic navigation that can position your uh, catheter into very, very, very small ventricle dramatically changed our uh, policy in shunt revision and really offered very, very significant advantages to patients that in the older times would not have been revised or would have been revised badly because the ventricles were so small that it was difficult to uh, refine the way in order to replace properly a ventricular catheter. But with the electromagnetic navigation, we can simply remove the old catheter, implant the new catheter into the larger part of the ventricle, and sometimes we can resolve the problem. Use programmable valve and consider anti-siphon devices, or I include in the anti-siphon devices the um, flow regulating valve. Of course, this is very, very important in children to have the possibility to modify the opening pressure of the valve if you see that your valve is draining too much. There are a very nice combination of a shunt assistant, of anti-siphon, of telemetric pressure sensor. They are uh, extremely uh, complex, not yet uh, well organized into one single device, but certainly the progress is there and they are uh, expensive, but they can be useful in, uh, uh, in managing some complex cases and uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of course, montage is too expensive to be proposed as a blanket cover policy to every patient. But certainly they are extremely helpful in, uh, in uh, uh, managing difficult cases. Uh, there are such a variety that is available in the market from uh, meters plus anti-siphon plus ProGav plus uh, gravity unit and or association of ProGav and ProSA. Uh, certainly uh, there is not a big difference between uh, the, uh, all these uh, association of devices, but certainly uh, association of some of the devices have been proven to be effective in managing uh, selected and complex cases. Again, uh, this cannot be used as a blanket cover policy for every patient, and you need to uh, meet the patient that uh, needs this kind of uh, 
uh, devices all together in, in order to try to modify uh, the uh, quality of life of your patient and resolve definitely the patients. Sometimes we use also to treat this uh, uh, slit ventricle syndrome, the uh, integral MPH low flow valve, it's off-label, uh, of course, uh, uh, for the slit ventricle syndrome. As you know, it is a, a, a modification of the OSV1 uh, that is set to drain approximately 20 cc per hour. The integral low flow valve is set to drain only 10 cc per hour. So it is a flow regulating valve with very high resistance to CSF flow. And it can be helpful either to resolve the problem, either to uh, uh, enlarge your ventricle in order to um, uh, allow uh, third ventriculostomy or uh, other uh, devices or other maneuver, surgical maneuver that can be performed only with a larger ventricle. For example, in this patient that is 17 years old, in this patient, the MPH was a, the final solution. It was hemorrhagic hydrocephalus with the ventricular atrial shunt. Between 2009 and 2012, nine shunt operation with a fixed middle pressure valve, then shifted to middle valve, then OSV2 valve, then Midas plus OSV2 valve in series, ProGav plus ETV plus zomboperitoneal shunt, nothing worked, absolutely nothing worked. But finally, when we were really desperate, we tried this uh, NPH low flow valve. And in this specific case, that was the final solution. And the patient is now symptom free since almost 10 years. And it came out of our observation. And we were very glad to resolve this problem with very, very complex and delicate patient. We use this very low flow valve in three patients. In one, it was a complete success, the one that I have just described. In another case, instead, it was a completely opposite. It was an immediate failure with the development of a high ICP symptoms and urgent revision. And in another case, it was a partial success. That means that the use of this low um, flow valve allowed for a ventricular dilatation before endoscopic for ventriculostomy. Uh, ventricles that were really very, very uh, difficult to dilate, even with the shunt externalization, were able to dilate slowly just because of the implant of this valve. Uh, of course, there is not a system that works for every patient that we will see later, but uh, having all knowledge of every kind of device that is available in the market, I think is very important in order to think about your patient, to think about which device fits to uh, your uh, perfect situation. In case of recurrence of symptoms, of course, we have always to check for an entrapped ventricle. And if we have a situation like this with a unilateral uh, slit ventricle and uh, more of foramen obstruction due to hyperdrainage and paradoxically high intracranial pressure that is due to the uh, hyper uh, pressure that is in the left hemisphere, then in this case, of course, there is a lack of communication. It is always created by the hyper drainage and by the deformation of the foramen on Monroe, very nicely described by uh, Hal Riquet, again, in a very nice paper describing the anatomy of the foramen on Monroe and the deformation of the foramen on Monroe uh, when uh, going subject to the excessive drainage of the contralateral side. In this case, uh, even if can be... Um, excessive treatment in the septostomy, even if I have a good experience of endoscopy, I don't like to imagine to perform a septostomy in this case, the ventricles are too small, the risk of injuring the contralateral thalamus is quite high, and so implanting a contralateral uh, catheter always connected in a Y above the valve, as uh, stated by Hal Riquet earlier, is very, very important. Both ventricles will have the same valve setting. And even if this patient looks uh, very terrific because uh, uh, he has absolutely not a single drop of CSF inside the ventricular catheter, this patient with this CT scan was absolutely perfect and resolved completely his uh, problem of uh, headache. And we have never operated him anymore since that time. So it is very important to treat the patient and not to treat the CT scan, uh, of course. Then the lumbar peritoneal shunt. Lumbar peritoneal shunt is also another weapon that we have that can be extremely effective alone or in association or in a Y connection with the uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt as described 
as well by Hal Ricate, who really said everything I can say uh, before in, uh, about the subject. Uh, this can be used in substitution or in addiction, isolated to the uh, VP shunt. That means VP shunt and the lumboperitoneal shunt uh, as a separate, completely separate uh, system, or with a lumbar catheter uh, that, or a cisternal catheter that is conjoined in Y connection above the uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt, above the valve. So it is a very interesting. Uh, um, solution because it uh, withdraws CSF from the subarachnoid spaces, encourages forward flow through the foramen of Monroe, and prevents closure of the foramen and equalizes transmantle pressure. So it can be used to treat a subgroup of super, um, slit ventricle syndrome patients with high ICP and functional ventricular peritoneal shunt. Again, rarely it is an isolated, complete solution, but it can be very helpful in association with the ventricular peritoneal shunt. Then, of course, we have to check for cranial cerebral disproportion and venous hypertension. And then, in this case, another good solution that we have, excellent solution that we have, is the calvarial expansion that will be uh, described later by um, uh, Carmine Motolese, uh, uh, who will talk about the posterior cranial dis um, uh, distraction. In this case, in our patient, in our very, very small series, we have a couple of patients who uh, resolve their problem with the cranial expansion. In this case, a post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus with a huge poroencephalic cavity. You see, he had, uh, he suffered the neonatal severe hemorrhage in the left frontal lobe. He developed a very significant porencephalic cavity. So the patient required shunting both in the porencephalic cavity and then later also in the uh, ventricle. So it's very complex patient because he has a, a double compartment shunting and uh, he underwent uh, many, many shunt revision and this was the uh, baseline uh, CT of this patient with a, a small catheter inside the uh, porencephalic cavity that has completely disappeared and a catheter inside the frontal, uh, inside the frontal horn. Um, this patient uh, clearly developed a craniocephalic disproportion. The stigmata of this, of course, is the tonsillar herniation that is witnessing a, a smaller posterior fossa. Uh, you can see also the shape of the forehead and the flattened posterior part of the of the head, so you can measure if you want, of course, the intracranial volume, but you know that this patient has a problem of cephalocranial uh, disproportion. So in these cases, uh, after all the multiple shunt revision, we propose finally the enlargement of the, uh, um, of the, uh, of the calvaria. Uh, it is not a distraction, it is a fixed enlargement, but every kind of enlargement works if you have not uh, distractors available. In my country, distractors are very expensive. So if you have not them available uh, or readily available, uh, then you can use a very nicely uh, system of fixation like this. It is very important, of course, to leave a central strip of bone in order to anchor the two flaps that you can produce at the level of the parietal bones, as you can see in this place, and you will have enough uh, uh, increase of intracranial volume in order to allow a small dilatation of the ventricle. And if this patient in five years follow-up only suffer one single episode of shunt dysfunction and we don't see him anymore due to the repeated and recurrent headache. Another case of uh, uh, clear evidence of cephalocranial disproportion, you can see the distortion of the uh, uh, of the uh, shape of the calvaria. You can see the, the forehead that, that is very, very uh, flattened. And uh, again, you can see the tonsillar herniation. And after uh, cranial volt expansion, so sorry, this is the same patient as before. And you can see that uh, there is not a resolution of the uh, chronic tonsillar herniation, but you can see the impact of the cranial expansion on the CSF circulating in the the foliation of the cerebellum and in the subarachnoid spaces of the cranial vault. And you see clearly that there is a reduction in the um, compression of the cerebellum inside the posterior fossa, although the uh, bone flap were performed supratentorially and they were not even uh, very large. Another case that we treated by 
um, cranial expansion. Again, very significant uh, chronic, tonsillar, chronic tonsillar herniation. Uh, this was a, a, a prenatal hydrocephalus that was shunted at birth, associated with the uh, um, uh, partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. Uh, very frequent headache and dizziness. Uh, ICP monitoring performing all performed almost 15 years ago. You can see that uh, it is not apparently pathological, but it is pathological for a patient that is shunted because over 40 over four days there was never uh, um, uh, negative pressure. So this patient, this three, um, uh, this uh, uh, graph is clearly pathological for a uh, uh, for a shunt. So in this case, we perform again uh, after trying to programmable valve six, uh, 160 millimeters of water, headache was continuing. So we again performed uh, cranial vault enlargement, always keeping the central part uh, above the sagittal sinus uh, intact in order to anchor the, uh, the, 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 the flaps. You can see we can uh, make an angle in the fixation in order to enlarge as much as possible the flap. And also this patient was uh, resolved by this. The solution of the uh, um, uh, recent solution of the uh, posterior distraction, the parietal distraction uh, by implanting uh, um, uh, the distractor and performing uh, distraction osteogenesis is certainly brilliant. Uh, I am not sure that it is absolutely necessary because uh, my experience with uh, uh, flaps is uh, excellent even without the distractor, but certainly this is a, a very, very nice and elegant solution. And uh, you can see that in uh, this experience of this patient, of uh, this uh, uh, group, the ventricles enlarge significantly after the uh, cranial vault expansion with the um, uh, oste um, op uh, osteogenesis, distraction osteogenesis. So certainly this is a very nice solution to treat uh, your patient, when you are sure that there is a cephalocranial disproportion, that is probably not the only cause, but is certainly a very significant concomitant cause of the troubles of CSF circulation. Then ATV and shunt removal. ATV and shunt removal is an excellent solution. Again, we see the name of Al Kate in a seminal paper of 1998, where the, he was proposing uh, quite um, enthusiastically the ventricular shunt removal that was the ultimate treatment of the slit ventricle syndrome. We can discuss about that for hours, of course. Uh, certainly was too much enthusiastic at the time. And we will see also why he proposed this um, algorithm of treatment in a patient admitted with a, a slit ventricle syndrome, ICP monitoring without uh, CSF drainage. And then there was a tree of the algorithm where there was a normal or asymptomatic uh, intracranial pressure, and he was proposing the shunt removal. And of course, this is uh, uh, very, very uh, enthusiastic, but in my practice, this does not exist. I have never found such a patient. Probably the rate of simple shunt removal only depends on how many non-hydrocephalic patients you have shunted in your previous years of practice. And uh, of course, the practice of some um, hydrocephalic experts mean that they collect complex cases from all over the country, even uh, coming from uh, centers uh, uh, that have not been managed in the neonatal period by pediatric neurosurgeon, and probably with a threshold of shunt implant that was too low in some areas of the world at a given historical time. And so probably too many of these patients were implanted with uh, abusive shunts, and uh, uh, probably only this is the um, uh, population that can benefit from shunt removal. Otherwise, much more complex, much more articulated is the um, uh, arm of the algorithm that was finding elevated or symptomatic ICP. Then endoscopy for ventriculostomy was performed. And the, if the ICP was controlled, then the patient was, of course, shunt independent. This is also quite rare in my uh, idea. But otherwise, there was all the other part of the algorithm that I warmly invite you to read because it is very nicely done and still very valid uh, nowadays. Uh, why I do not believe very much in the, this part of the arm? So why I do not believe very much in the fact that the ETV can really uh, make shunt independent the patient? Because also there is a bias. It depends. The rate of successful ETV in uh, speed ventricle syndrome depends on two factors. 
how many aqueducta stenosis you have shunted in your previous years of practice. That means when I started endoscopy, many shunt malfunction occurred in patients shunted because of aqueducta stenosis because ETV did not exist yet at that time. So of course, the rate, the population of patient that was possible to get rid of the shunt was extremely high. But of course, uh, with the time, these things have changed significantly. Now we are using ETV very trivially and very frequently whenever we see an aqueductal stenosis, even maybe, uh, maybe too much, but certainly most of the surgeons have this weapon in their armamentary, and so they can use ETV very effectively. And so the population of a patient with aqueductal stenosis that receive a shunt as a first treatment is exceedingly rare. So of course, these patients, when they come with this slit ventricle syndrome, have already been treated by, um, by ETV, and they do not, uh, basically, they do not develop SBS because they have been properly treated. Or, of course, the second factor is how many hydrocephalic patients who were communicating at the first shunt secondarily became obstructive. And this is also unpredictable. I mean, that is a, this was also demonstrated many, many years ago at the era of ventriculography that the patients that were shunting and the first shunt with a communicating hydrocephalus, not only tetraventricular, but freely communicating between the ventricle and the supraraquine spaces, when they were coming later at uh, shunt malfunction, they demonstrated at ventriculography uh, aqueductal stenosis. So these secondary uh, aqueductal stenosis exist. It is real. We can see at MRI all time. And of course, this population is uh, unpredictable. And so we cannot predict how many um, slit ventricle syndrome patient can be really treated by endoscopic ventriculostomy. In my practice, only happened once. Uh, in, uh, ETV was performed in four patients out of the small series that we have, in which during shunt malfunction, the ventricular system is large enough to admit the endoscope. And the ETV failed in all cases but one. So three failure and one success. And even the success was extremely complex and difficult to obtain, and I will explain why. This is the case with a, a shunt in the first year of life for hydrocephalus, secondary to a quadrigenial arachnoid cyst that was treated in another uh, department, and the first endoscopic procedure was complicated by a very severe hemorrhage who left a very significant poroencephalic area in the, in the posterior part of the brain. Then he came to our observation when he was 12 years old with daily invalidating headache. You can see that there are slit ventricle and the shunt is working. Then we, we try to be smart when we implanted an ICP transducer, a telemetric transducer, but unfortunately this was complicated by frontal hematoma. So it was probably our first telemetric ICP transducer and we were very surprised to have this very, very rare complication, but finally we were not able to measure the ICP of this patient, of course, because we had to remove the uh, ICP transducer and remove the um, intracerebral uh, hematoma uh, by the mean of uh, endoscopic lavage. Uh, then we decided, of course, for uh, exadjuvantibus method, we uh, implanted a medus valve and we upgraded until 200 millimeters of water, but still this patient was continuing to have headache and ventricle were remaining slit. This was the baseline CT scan with a middle valve at 200 millimeters of water. Then we change it and we change the middles with a, a low flow MPH valve that I described before. And this happened in July 2015. And this was a nice, nice secondary effect. The ventricle enlarged very, very slowly, allowing finally the access to uh, uh, endoscope in order to perform and endoscopic third ventriculosomy. We were sure that there was an aqueductal obstruction because the, the problem in this patient was an uh, cyst of the um, quadrigeminal system. So there was an um, extrinsic uh, compression of the aqueduct. So we performed the uh, ETV and uh, because the, the, the headache was continuing. So of course we were uh, obliged to perform the ETV. And this is how the ventricle of such a patient looked like Anatomy is very difficult to understand. And even I will show you just rapidly the flow of the third ventricle that is really very difficult to recognize in, 
this patient and uh, without the navigation it would have been incredibly difficult to understand where to perform our uh, our uh, hole in the in the floor fortunately it was uh, perfectly uneventful very effective and we performed the etv the valve was uh, changed during the same setting and we implanted a circus valve who has the possibility to be implanted with a virtual off that means that is uh, basically completely closed so we were believing very much in the etv and as you know here you can see the uh, aqueductal stenosis but at the same time the valve was open uh, on the third turn post-operative days because it was a subcutaneous CSF collection. Then three months later, the patient presented a shunt infection. So the VP shunt had to be removed and an external lumbar drainage was implanted. And surprisingly, external lumbar drainage was removed without any recurrence of the symptoms. So this patient finally is shunt-free with a five years follow-up. Uh, it was a desperate ETV that finally worked but it worked uh, only after very, very complex and long uh, surgical and uh, clinical observation period. So some patient can be really very complex. Telemetric ICP monitoring is a very nice <clears throat> device that can be used in difficult cases. It gives to you the possibility to implant the device and to monitor the ICP every time you want, and you can send the patient home even with the monitor in order to uh, monitor the, um, the, the ICP uh, overnight. Uh, this case was a six-year-old female. Uh, he had an ETV and the posterior fossa dermoid removal at the age of one year. Um, ETV failed, so the VP shunt had to be implanted and the patient came back with recurrent headache and vomiting. This is the case uh, that is for whom I am responsible. Uh, for the creation of the so-called slit ventricle syndrome. She's suffering intense headache and vomiting with spontaneous resolution following two, three days and two episodes per month for two months. So they were really invalidating with an alternance of normal symmetrical ventricle and hyperdrainage on the side of the shunt. And in the baseline CT, when the ventricle are larger, there is a low pressure. And uh, uh, when the shunt is working too much, the pressure becomes high because, of course, the contralateral ventricle goes in hypertension. And this is a very typical of this, again, an isolation of the um, foramen of Monroe. And also in this case, the shunt was revised. It's changing the valve with a programmable valve with an antisiphon device. There was no resolution. And uh, the um, uh, patient was finally the uh, shunt infection 45 days later. It was exteriorized. Lumboperitoneal shunt implantation following resolution of the infection, and with a single lumboperitoneal shunt, the patient is uh, symptom free and uh, he's in excellent shape. So in this case, in this case, uh, of course, the lumboperitoneal shunt could be implanted uh, uh, without problems because there was already an open ETV, so there was already a free communication between the ventricle and the subarachnoid space that was confirmed by the uh, MRI. So we go back to the very nice presentation of, of uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, who was very uh, nice in describing how to avoid a slit ventricle syndrome. This is a major chapter of the, um, our practice in this time. Slit ventricle syndrome should be prevented and can be prevented. And this should be crystal clear to young neurosurgeon and to whoever is starting his own practice immediately after his residency, uh, becoming a consultant. Forget in your practice low pressure and very low pressure valve. You just take them from the shelves of your operating room and you just go send back to the manufacturer. Do not implant ever. Shunt your baby, especially the post hemorrhagic cardiocephalus, as late as possible, at least with a middle pressure valve, or if possible, in your setting and in your country, with a programmable or a flow regulating valve. Try to use every possible device in order to limit and to decrease and to regulate upgrading the pressure valve uh, that you have in order to avoid ventricular collapse. In post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, keep the temporizing device uh, in ventricular subgalial in place as long as you can. We stopped to use the OMAI approximately 10 years ago. We are now using ventricular subgalial that gives to you the possibility of keeping the device in place and there is no need to tap it and so you really make the difference between the patient who needs a shunt and the patient 
who does not need a shunt because uh, his post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus resolved spontaneous, spontaneously. So take your time, uh, raise the threshold of uh, your uh, shunt implant in order not to be uh, too quick in implanting your uh, shunt. Recognize the patient who will be uh, uh, autonomic, uh, autonomous in uh, his CSF circulation and will not need a shunt. Avoid the ventricular collapse on early post-op ultrasound, CT or MRI, recognize it immediately, upgrade the valve as soon as you see the ventricle that are going down too quickly or with a subdural uh, collection and set your programmable valve always at the highest value tolerated by the baby. Always you can get, check the frontal, you can check by ultrasound. During the first six months of life, you have a lot of possibility to tuning, very fine and nice tuning of your uh, opening pressure in order to uh, keep your uh, valve resistance as high as possible uh, in order to uh, decrease the possibility or the risk of overdrainage in the following year. When we go back to the all the nice uh, listing of the uh, treatment of the uh, uh, slit ventricle syndrome, we can consider very important this group of things, upgrading to high pressure valve, additional antisiphon, revising to flow regulating, revising to programmable valve. All these lines are all with the same uh, principle of reducing the flow and uh, reducing the risk of overdrainage by upgrading your valve and increasing the outflow resistance through your valve. This is really very, very important. Then, of course, you have to consider the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. In my practice, work uh, very, very rarely, and your percentage of success depends, as I said, of how numerous is the uh, population of aqueductal stenosis you are dealing with that have been uh, mistakenly treated with a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So if you are taking in charge uh, a practice of another surgeon who is older than you and who has in continuously implanted shunt and who was not keen with the endoscopy, then be sure that your population of uh, uh, slit ventricle syndrome that can be cured by endoscopic ventriculostomy can be very high. Lumboperitoneal shunt is uh, very interesting, very important, alone or in association with others. So it's really a very, very nice solution. And then among the, all the expansile procedure, I would keep in mind only the ones that uh, are basically and faster and very easy, just a two large bone flap that you can create. And the destruction of stereogenesis is elegant. It is uh, probably uh, more expensive, uh, but certainly as effective as the uh, other ones. The pillars of treatment uh, progressively invasive in my very limited experience for the slit ventricle syndrome, as I have already resumed before, are the ICP monitoring, the valve upgrade with an uh, antisiphon device or with a flow regulated shunt. ETV can be useful, the uh, lumboperitoneal, lumboperitoneal shunt and cranial expansion. The first two are ICP monitoring and valve upgrade can be useful and uh, sometimes fundamental for understanding, but of course, uh, the, they are rarely resolutive in my personal practice. The other three instead, ETV, DLP, and cranial expansion, they are usually effective. Sometimes it is necessary to make an association of um, sometimes even of all three of them in order to find the correct algorithm for your patient. And remember that uh, slit ventricle syndrome patients differ from each other. One algorithm does not fit all. You have to find the ideal uh, surgical or medical pathway for your patient. And for this, uh, it is stupid to say, but I think it is incredibly important, a careful, detailed review of patient's history and x-rays is mandatory. Before touching a patient, go to look for the first MRI, go to look for the first CT scan and check all the succession of the radiological exam in order to better understand the, what has happened to your patient in the years that precede the development of slit ventricle syndrome. Always rule out an aqueductal stenosis, either primary or secondary, because this patient has higher chances of being treated by um, ETV uh, alone. And please tailor your treatment to that individual patient. Don't get stick to an uh, algorithm written by someone else 
know that algorithm, know all the possible uh, solutions of that situation and try to find what is better for your patient and for the individual um, specific need of that patient. In conclusion, SBS treatment has been mainly anecdotically reported in absence of large case series reporting specific results and treatment outcomes. Frequent confusion of patients and terminology are a real flow and uh, uh, for this patient and uh, a great confusion that still exists nowadays in spite of all the efforts of the giants who came before us. Treatment mainly consists of attempts to control CSF over drainage and improving cerebral compliance. Keep these two things in mind, uh, control CSF over drainage and improve cerebral compliance and you will find the light for your patient uh, earlier than you can expect. The availability of modern and sophisticated programmable valves of the new solution, they are not the final solution, but certainly gives more uh, weapons in attempts to prevent and manage the lead ventricle syndrome. Prevention of ventricular collapse is the key and is your precise responsibility of pediatric neurosurgeon to prevent the ventricular collapse at first shunt implant. Forget low pressure valve and please set the opening pressure of your valve to the highest value tolerated by your patient. Telemetric system are certainly a nice device, very useful for diagnostic and complex situation. Ideally, we should have a telemetric device implanted in every shunt in order to have real time, as was said before by Dr. Krishnamurti, real time continuous monitoring of our ICP and flow possibly inside the valve in every situation during night and in every position of the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Cinelli, for this very comprehensive, at the same time, very clear overview uh, on this problem. Um, I, I very much appreciate everything, but probably in particular, the, the, the respect, the sense of respect in approaching these patients. And, and, and you reminding us that they're all different and these are small numbers in the end. So we got a lot of weapons. It's true they need to be used wisely. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Narin, I understand that for the sake of time, it's probably better if we postpone the questions. I'm sure there will be plenty. Um, so Absolutely. We... Professor Sinali, there are lots of questions, but is it okay because of the schedule of the other speakers just to go through their talks and then come to the discussion, if that's okay with you? Of course, of course. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Marion uh, Prodholm. Uh, she's a... Uh, uh, a physicist and a, a fluid uh, dynamics engineer with the SOFISA. I heard her lecture on uh, the physics of, um, of a siphoning effect in uh, Lyon two years ago, uh, the conference that Professor Montrelis, uh, Carmen Montrelis um, organized. And I learned a lot from her. And uh, since uh, she is an uh, uh, expert on that and I am her student, I think it's better for me to get her to talk uh, on the physics. I will cover the um, shunt hardware after Professor Montelis's talk. Uh, Dr. Prodholm, would you like to share your presentation? Thanks. I, yep, I'll, I'll make it. Uh, can you hear me? You, can, you should be yes. able to. Great. Thanks. Can you, can you hear me? Great. Yes, thank great, you very great. much for your introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, it's a pleasure and it will only be a very small screenshot of one part of the over drainage issue. Um, I have to say in the introduction that I have a big conflict of interest because I'm uh, employed by the Sofisa company, which is a shunt manufacturer. Um, I think I won't go in details into this topic today, but uh, take this into account in, to my lecture. Can you um, share, your, share your presentation, uh, Dr. Prudhoff? Yes, Thanks. I think. Does it work? Yes, great, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm looking for my, okay. So today's content will be a small introduction about the shunt equation and um, the basic math that, that's behind. We will discuss a little bit about hypotheses and limits of this shunt equation and use a paper that has been published by the UCLA team 
uh, on in vivo measurement in order to be able to compare this to the, to the theory. So first, as you know, the shunt equation is uh, based on the um, Bernoulli's principle, the simplified Bernoulli's principle, and make the relationship between the ICP and the intra-abdominal pressure uh, with regards to the pressure setting of the valve and the hydrostatic pressure related to the heights in between the two ends of the shunt. What is called siphon effect in everyday life is actually the fact that when you have a hydrostatic pressure difference in between two open containers, and if you have a tube that is uh, filled with fluid in between these two containers, you will have flow in the tube. Of course, the question that arises is that, is it now applicable to shunt? Because it's actual, uh, it's true to say that we have two containers that change in terms of height. You have the, the lying position and the standing position with two different positions of the two containers. But um, the question is, does the siphon effect uh, appear in this situation? The first answer is that we have to, of course, to remember that we are talking about closed containers and not uh, open containers at atmospheric pressure. So it's definitely the first thing to take into account both intracranial pressure and intra-abdominal pressure. To, um, to recalculate the shunt equation. This is what has been done um, in the literature. So if you take the simplified shunt equation when the patient is lying, you have the first line. And if you add the hydrostatic pressure change when the patient is standing up, you have this second line. So if you compare um, uh, and, you have to, and you want to express the siphon effect as the difference um, in between the lying position and the standing position, you have to express the intracranial pressure when standing as the intracranial pressure when lying down plus a change in the intracranial pressure because you know that there are physiological changes that makes that ICB is actually decreasing when the patient stands up and IAP is actually increasing. And same thing on the other end. And if you, if you take this into account, then you can uh, express your siphon effect your theoretical siphon effect as the difference in between the hydrostatic pressure and the physiological changes of the intra-abdominal and intracranial pressure. We are still here in the theory based on Bernoulli's principle. If you take a look at the natural changes of uh, ICP, it has been published that there is a natural decrease of ICP when the patient stands up. This uh, decrease is stronger when um, in the first degrees of uh, tilt of the head of body. And um, probably more and more data in the literature make the relationship between this uh, drastic initial change and the fact that there might be a transfer of CSF from the cranial, cranial area to the lumbar area, um, explaining, accounting for this initial strong decrease of ICP, which is uh, uh, then lower when the patient continue to stand up. As far as the intra-abdominal pressure is uh, concerned, we also know that uh, standing up uh, triggers an, uh, an increase of the intra-abdominal pressure um, and it has been also published in the literature. So just taking this into account, if uh, we do some basic calculation about the increase of hydrostatic pressure and the change in between uh, ph physiological changes uh, of the intracranial and interabdominal pressure, we see that uh, approximately two thirds of the hydrostatic pressure are cancelled out by the physiological changes. So this is still about the, the theory of the siphon effect. The problem that adds to that is that in order to be able to apply the simplified Bernoulli's principle, we have to follow four strong hypotheses. The first one is that we have to speak about an incompressible fluid, which is kind of accurate for CSF since it's approximately looking like water. Second one is, is, is that it has to be considered as a zero viscosity fluid, which is maybe uh, something that we can discuss, but we can consider that it behaves a, li a little bit like water, at least when there is no infection or no blood in the CSF. Searching that it has to be steady flow, which is kind of um, inaccurate with the parasitic behavior of ICP. And of course, 
we assume it triggers versatile flow inside the shunt. And last thing, which is completely inaccurate, this shunt it has is that it has to have no resistance. It means that in order to be able to apply a Bernoulli's principle, and so to apply the shunt equation, we have to neglect all the resistance of the shunt. But of course, you know that the shunt is designed to oppose resistance to CSF flow. The valve setting itself, but also the catheter, you know that the longer is the catheter, the more resistant it is. The smaller it is in terms of diameter, the more resistant it is, and so on. So this uh, force hypothesis is definitely not uh, met when we speak about a shunt, which makes, you will see afterwards in the in vivo results, that the theory is uh, overestimating the siphon effect because all the dampening parameters are neglected. So the, the, the in vivo study I was mentioning has been published by uh, Berg Schneider and colleagues back in 2004. Uh, it's a study on 11 uh, shunted patients, all uh, shunted for uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus with differential pressure valves. Um, in this study, it's a codman Akim valve, which can be set in between 30 millimeter water and 200 millimeter water. And during this study, there is in vivo measurement of the intracranial pressure and intra-abdominal pressure with an invasive measurement. Um, and there the two parameters that are um, varied uh, during the study are the adjustment of the valve in between the minimum and maximum pressure, but also the angle, the inclination of the head of bed in order to make it vary in between uh, zero and 55 degrees. And this actual in vivo measurements are compared with the theoretical model, taking into account the physiological changes of the ICP and IAP. There are lots of results in this uh, paper. Uh, and some that uh, I found interesting to share. This one is uh, showing, is comparing the evolution of ICP with regards to the valve opening pressure uh, with the patient uh, uh, lying only. You see that the dashed line is corresponding to the theoretical data uh, obtained from the shunt equation, and the, um, the line in the lower part is corresponding to the in vivo measurement. We see that the model is too simplified and not enough dampened. Um, we also see that there is a good cor cor uh, linear correlation in between the ICP and the valve pressure setting, but there is a non-unity slope, meaning that uh, if you increase the valve pressure setting by 30 millimeter of water, for instance, it doesn't mean that you increase the ICP by 30 millimeter of water. So of course it's intuitive and I'm sure you know this, but once again, it shows how the um, theoretical model over uh, underestimates the dampening role of, um, of uh, shunt. So this is just to make um, a small remark about the evolution of ICP. So here in this uh, measurement, which lasts approximately one hour and a half, uh, you have the measurement of um, the ICP for patients. There is just an initial change of the inclination of the body from zero to 30 degrees. And what we see in the, on the measurement is that there is the initial reduction, which is quickly stabilized. We also see that there are strong variations of ICP, even if the patient is not doing anything um, if with the amplitude around 50 millimeter of water. And we also see some longer waves uh, variation um, during the time. Last result, but uh, maybe more complete one, is the comparison of the measurement of ICP when the patient uh, change of body of uh, the head of body, so meaning the inclination of the of the body of the patient from zero degree to fifty five. On the upper part, uh, you see that uh, it's what was planned by the theoretical model. And on the lower part, you have the in vivo measurements. The, all the different lines correspond to a uh, different pressure setting of the shunt from 30 millimeter water to 200. And it's compared with the measurement uh, before uh, the patient was shunted. So the, the bold line called prescient is this. So what we can see in this, um, in this uh, graph is that uh, the theoretical model is really overestimating the siphoning effect of a differential pressure valve. Uh, also, we see that uh, if we take a look at the in vivo measurement, 
um, there is a physiological lowering of ICP with the valve, meaning that the shape of the curve is actually looking like the prescient shape in terms of variation of ICP with postural changes. Of course, the, the curve is lower than the prescient curve because there is drainage. This is the reason why there is a shunt, but there is not this drastic over drainage that the theoretical model forecasted. And on this measurement, we can also measure the actual siphon effects. We see that the maximum siphon effect is measured for the lower pressure setting. So uh, with regards to the, to the last uh, talk we had, it's actually also a good thing to, to go for high pressure valves because it's uh, also reducing the siphon effect in the shunt. But even when uh, taking into account the maximum uh, siphon effect, it was only 50 millimeter of water in this example, and only 10 millimeter of water of siphon effect if you take a look at the setting 200. If you compare to the, to the theoretical model, it shows that uh, actually the theoretical model is, uh, is uh, approximately four times higher in terms of siphon effect than the uh, actual in vivo measurements. So of course, there are some limitations in, in this study. It's only on 11 uh, patients, only on 8 pH uh, indication. But um, it's a first uh, clue um, in order to, to study and understand what is the actual hydrodynamics uh, in the shunts. And, to our, um, and I think it's important to underline the fact that uh, we cannot reduce um, over drainage issues uh, to siphon effects. So just to conclude on this, um, the key messages are that the theoretical model based on the shunt equation and based on the Bernoulli's principle is actually overestimating the siphon effect in the shunt. The actual siphon effect in the shunt is, is comprised in between 10 and 50 millimeters of water. High pressure valves limit siphon effects and also there are plenty other uh, phenomena that has, have to be taken into account to understand over the age issue. So, to conclude, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm definitely positive that it was taken into account throughout all the, the conference I was uh, listening to uh, since the beginning of this conference, um, we cannot reduce over drainage to a basic hydrodynamical issue in a tube, and it's uh, far more complicated as, uh, as you are perfectly used to it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prodholm. That's a fantastic talk. Um, I think we had a philosophical and we had science, we had um, clinical, and it's great to have the physics. Um, it's an important talk. And the good thing is that I have, I have uh, recorded it and I will send you the links to everyone to see um, Dr. Prodholm's as well as other speakers' talks. Uh, because I have seen both over drainage uh, as well as also under drainage, particularly during the um, during the COVID, we have we do telephonic clinics. Patients come with a quite a large um, ventricle. Can I just ask uh, Professor Sinali and Professor Krishnamurti and Dr. Kalisto to make any comments on whether we underestimate or overestimate uh, the um, the siphon effect? Uh, Professor Sinali, can I start with you? Um... No, I, I don't think that we uh, underestimate. It is uh, the, the, the ICP registration that uh, uh, have been done in the past that show uh, in vivo uh, ICP recording of uh, drop in the ICP uh, in the first uh, 20, 30 minutes immediately after the changing of the position. And then the secondary dramatic drop after 30, 40 minutes of standing position are a clear uh, demonstration in vivo that uh, this is due to the siphon. We do, I don't think that we uh, underestimate uh, siphon effect. That is, uh, this is a very well-known physical effect. Uh, it is, uh, the, the shunt is a the tubing that is unfortunately relatively simple. Uh, it is, I would say, even too simple according to the level of technology that we have available in uh, many other medical devices, as said by Dr. Krishnamurti, we are just dealing with uh, um, an incredible low technology device that is probably due to the fact that the uh, babies and the elderly 
are very unprotected social categories. And uh, <laughs> I would say that the uh, amount of money that uh, the, is spent in research and development of these devices is uh, by far incredibly lower if compared to the uh, huge capitals that are invested in research and development in heart uh, pathology or uh, coronary bypass and stenting and every other um, arrhythmia. I, I don't know why, I don't know why, uh, but my idea is that unfortunately the uh, hydrocephalus is more frequent in unprotected uh, social uh, categories and uh, this should be taken into account because technology of the shunt is really quite archaic if compared to what is going on in the medicine nowadays in other fields. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cinali. Um, uh, there, was, there, have, there are at least one paper that uh, talks of gravitational valves in, in patients who are, um, are not mobile, having uh, uh, under drainage. Uh, um, Dr. Satish Krishnamurti, have you come across under drainage uh, in your practice? But certainly I am seeing under drainage here, but I just wanted to know your side. Thanks. Uh, y yes. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I think um, some patients have uh, the need for more CSF to be drained. And, 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 and the, problem, the problem is, um, I want to echo Professor Chinali's statement. I think it's, it's the stepchild of neuroscience, his study of hydrocephalus. And, and although we uh, globally, I think it's a $300 billion industry, I don't think there is enough done to understand how, what the CSF does and how much CSF flows and what is the ideal CSF uh, drainage that is necessary to treat a person to bring them back to normal. The, the, the issue is uh, we look at, um, we look at, um, uh, the ventricle size and and say it's over drainage or under drainage, but, but we really don't know exactly um, how much is being drained and what is an ideal size of the ventricle to get the results. So uh, I think it's important, like many speakers mentioned, we need to carefully listen to the patients and and or their caregivers to make sure that we. Uh, have an estimate of whether it is over or under, and then probably uh, get the actual measurements of the ICP to make sure that we are correcting the shunt in the right direction. I think it's important uh, to have quantitative measures, and we're trying to do that using the uh, T half for macromolecules, et cetera, but it's nowhere close to using it in the clinical setting. Um, I think it may be it may be time to um, advocate for a use of a flow sensor through the, through the tube so that we can at least understand whether the shunt works all the time, some of the time, or only intermittently. Um, it's a poor device. I think I, I absolutely agree with you that for the amount of what shunt has done to our patients and the amount of operations that we do, it's probably so little, as Dr. Sinali said, invested on understanding the physics and it's mainly with the uh, uh, industry rather than uh, i'm certainly the cambridge unit has a good shunt testing system but i think we as neurosurgeons don't put enough and, and don't know enough of the physics to get involved in actually be involved in the actual understanding of the physics and uh, technology uh, mr callisto can can i just get you to make any comments on over yes. and under drainage Yes, Naren, I certainly agree with, with my colleagues. It's why my experience is smaller. Um, my feeling is that we got just a limited grasp of the problem itself. But um, luckily, the, the sense of direction, the trend is towards patients being more the owners of their own treatment, which makes a lot of sense with this condition in, in, in particular. We don't even know what the right pressure is in, in some of these patients. So something that may work in one patient may be the wrong setting for another patient. So yes, as you know, we make a lot of use of the intracranial pressure monitoring probes in our units. Um, it's a procedure that we keep short and uh, easy. We do 
large numbers of this, we are guided by um, not just the numbers themselves to uh, decide on pressures and type of valves, but also by what patients feel to be the right pressure for them. And sometimes it takes time for them to realize that um, their headaches are not necessarily related with the numbers. Sometimes it takes time to understand that they will not be able to improve their symptoms, which will be independent from the numbers and from the physics. But to a certain extent, it empowers them to make the decisions they will be able to own long term. Thank, thank you very much. Now, once again, I thank Dr. Marion Prudhomme for this absolutely important lecture. I think we should uh, learn more on the physics and hopefully she and other colleagues will help us. Thank you very much. I will, Thanks to you. Thank you very much, Marion. I really appreciate it. Um, I will just see whether Dr. Um, so it gives me a distinct honor and privilege to introduce Professor Carmen Motterlis. Uh, he's one of the giants of pediatric neurosurgery and uh, in uh, he's at in Lyon. And uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed going to the Lyon hydrocephalus meeting. Uh, and I attended it two years ago and I came with so many great ideas. If anyone is interested in hydrocephalus, uh, you know, I will definitely urge you to attend these meetings. In fact, they had their meeting on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it was a big meeting. And Professor Montelis has kindly come to share his experience on cranial expansion for um, uh, slit ventricular syndrome. Uh, Professor um, Motelis, could you please uh, share? Uh, thank you, sir. I'll just unmute. Great, thanks. Professor Motelis, can you hear me? Professor Motelis, can you hear me? Professor Motelis, can you share your presentation? I think Dr. Motelis, Professor Motelis is having problem with this audio. The, So, so while Prof. Mortalis is trying to connect, oh, uh, great, brilliant, thank you. Well, Prof. Mortalis, we can't hear your voice. Uh, So what I will do is that while Prof. Motelis tries to get back, I will give my talk on shunt hardware. Uh, okay. Prof. Motelis will go to this talk and then come back to you. Hope you can uh, come to us. Thank you. Uh, can you all see my uh, presentation? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. Thanks. So, let me just go. so this is a presentation on uh, shunt technologies. Many times we use shunts and we have a, uh, some grasp, but I hope this, uh, uh, this overview gives you a slightly more idea of the shunt technologies that we have. Uh, so in terms of uh, declaration of competing interest uh, uh, for previous courses uh, that I have organized or symposiums I've organized, I have got uh, uh, support from Codman and B. Braun and I had attended a Sofisa factory visit uh, about seven years ago. 
and I'm not part of any shunt procurement or anything at all. So in terms of the shunts, uh, we have got proximal catheters, valves, and the distal, distal catheters. And as we have already uh, gone through with our colleagues that Nelson and Split started the uh, shunt valve with the then proximal split valve. I think the um, advent of the silicon rubber was uh, the harbinger for the development of shunt technology because it was auto clavable and it did not uh, deteriorate or generally did not deteriorate and it's non-sticky and it has less reaction to tissues. In terms of valves, there are, as we all know, there's, there's a differential pressure valves, which based on difference in pressure across the valve, uh, flow control valves, as Dr. Professor Sinali has mentioned, the gravitational valves and the program valves. I'll take you through them. Like an anatomy of anything, it's always good to know the anatomy of a valve in the strata program valve. You have got the inlet, then there's a proximal occluder uh, as well as a distal occluder. So, it's, so that allows you to test proximal and distally. Then you have got the reservoir and this delta chamber is an anti-siphon device. And uh, so you, I'm just uncluttering my, um, uncluttering my screen, sorry. And so, so a shunt valve system uh, has, this is the adjustable valve mechanism. So it has got many technologies uh, that are in it. Um, as we all know, pressure is force per unit area and um, pressure in the head, uh, we usually compare it to the pressure outside to the atmosphere. And uh, if you put an ICP bolt, if I'm standing, it's usually negative. Um, and that would be because uh, um, the CSF going down, but whether it's a negative in a normal person or whether it's negative in a person with a VP shunt that we are doing an ICP measuring is another question. But what I'm trying to get to is that when we talk about pressure in the head, we are talking it is relative to the atmosphere and the head is essentially cut off from the atmosphere because of the skull. We use EVDs and we are all familiar with what, what pressure is and what and in terms of when we talk about opening pressures, closing pressures, what we are talking about the pressure of the uh, intracranial pressure that would drive it. So mechanism of differential pressure valve, uh, we have to have a, a, a apparatus that opens and then closes depending on the pressure differential across that valve. There are four main uh, types of valve system, the uh, slit valve, the ball and um, valve, the membrane valve, and duct bill or mitre type valve. The slit valve, which was, as I said, the first one, is basically a slit. Uh, and uh, as the pressure increases, the slit opens up to let the, let the, um, let the fluid flow. And, uh, and usually, uh, there was a slide there, usually uh, this is in a, in a on the side of the tubing and uh, uh, it's in a case. And the duct bill or meter valve is like a two leaves. Once again, it opens up when the pressure is high and then closes the, when the pressure is low. Again, the, it, this is usually encased in uh, an apparatus. So this is a meter valve within an apparatus and depending on the pressure, this opens up. And this is the slit valve. The slit is on the side that opens up when the pressure is greater than the opening pressure of a valve. The diaphragmatic valve, which was a kind of a second generation valve in the sense that um, it allowed uh, more control. And here, when the pressure increases, then the diaphragm gets pushed down and the fluid comes out. Once again, the opening of this, the, the, the space between the diaphragm um, is uh, uh, influenced by the pressure. The more pressure that opens it up. In terms of ball and spring valve, here you have a ball and a spring, and the spring uh, allows to control the pressure. And then depending on what's the pressure of the CSF that's coming in, then it either pushes the ball and then the CSF goes through. So that's the mechanism of ball and spring valve. 
one of the things that you need to really uh, understand is that the, if you are testing the valve, then there's the closing and opening pressure. Opening pressure is this, you know, if you slightly increase the pressures and see when the uh, valve starts to flow and at what rate, and then you go along this curve. But when you then come, whenever we are using a manometer and coming down the pressure as the fluid runs through, then what we are doing is the closing pressure. So because of a phenomenon called hysteresis, because of silicon memory, the actual closing pressure is usually lower than the opening pressure. And whenever it's really difficult to measure the opening pressure, I think the companies use some mathematical system for estimating the opening pressure. Uh, but to, it's important to understand these two are uh, different. Flow control valve, as uh, Professor Sinali mentioned, it's, uh, it has got a diag diaphragm. And when the pressure is low and the low resistance, you get the flow. And uh, when it's um, uh, medium pressure, then uh, the, uh, if you see this notch, it goes up and then limits the flow. But however, if the pressure is very high, then this mechanism gets pushed out and then says the flow uh, resumes. Uh, this is a safety mechanism. And this is a, a slide from the Cambridge team uh, where they have looked at the flow uh, across the pressure uh, in a flow control valve. And you see how the flow control valve manages to hold on to the flow at a steady state for a, um, a considerable pressure range. We are all familiar with the different programmable shunts. And this is the Kotnum and Hakim shunts. And the, the question with them is whether they are MRA compatible. And in the um, uh, one of the earlier versions uh, um, of uh, uh, one of the companies, it, they were affected by the iPad too, but that's now all um, not a problem. And they can range from 30 millimeters of uh, water uh, to 400 millimeters of water, and this being a virtual off. Uh, so this can be used in patients who you are put a shunt, but who needs intrathecal um, uh, intrathecal chemotherapy, you can put it up to 400 and uh, try to uh, give the sh uh, give the medication intrathecally safely. In terms of the siphon effect, as we as Dr. Prodholm mentioned, the, the 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 definition of siphon is the fluid go up uh, has to go up and come down and um, uh, so if uh, you can, if when you make this height zero, then it will be a straight one. And basically the, um, the siphon effect works because the column of fluid, this one is, is longer than this one. So the weight is greater here. So the fluid comes down and because that creates a vacuum, the fluid gets from here, gets pulled up. If I make a hole in the top of this tube and the atmosphere is open to, then you will find that this column and this column drops down. So this is like having a chain across a pulley. And if one chain is longer than one, one limb is longer than the other, then it pulls the whole thing down on that side. It's the same principle. There are many uh, uh, settings uh, and also um, uh, there are different sizes depending on the children. Uh, of the patient. There are different anti-siphon devices. The anti-siphon device from Integra is, um, uses a membrane uh, th uh, that, so when the patient stands up, there's a negative pressure because of flow siphoning effect. That decreases the pressure here and that causes the atmosphere to push the membrane down and increases the resistance and decreases the flow. And this is a delta chamber. You have all heard of delta chamber. The difference with the delta chamber is usually it's closed uh, and only the pressure opens the, opens the membrane system for the flow to go through. So here the, the anti-siphon is usually closed until the pressure, uh, um, when pressure is high and whereas in the, the anti-siphon device, it's usually the anti-siphon effect uh, when the patient stands up causes decrease in pressure and the atmosphere closes. The gravitational mechanism, uh, which uh, uh, Mitka and also Sofisa and some other companies use, is basically when the patient is standing up, the fluid comes through here. Oh, sorry. 
through here and there's a sapphire bowl or, and these bowls are on it so that the flow to go through it, then there's increased resistance. But when the patient is lying down, these, these bowls are away so the fluid can go without the resistance. So that's how you change the um, gravitational mechanism in this gravitational one. So with the with the, the gravitational valves, you have got the gravitational component and the programmable component. They come as two. You can also change the anti-gravity um, uh, devices uh, setting, and it used to be called PROSA. Nowadays, it's called M Blue. This is from um, from Metke. And the anti-siphon devices they can be inserted separately, but if they are membrane-based, like the delta chamber or the anti-siphon device from Metronics, then you need to put it on the skull for the for the atmosphere to press on. But if it is gravitational unit, it doesn't matter where you put it on as long as it's vertical. Then there are shun reservoirs with the, which you can measure the ICP telemetrically. They are expensive. Probably they will be useful if they were less expensive. And in children, these larger reservoirs can cause pressure. Uh, and the, the mid case just come up with a, um, a ICP telemetric system, which is in line, but without the reservoir so that uh, you can still use it to telemetrically measure the pressure. As you know, we still don't have any studies that compare different valve system to say which one is better. Uh, we all have our preferences, probably how we are trained and our past uh, past uh, experience. So the LP valves, there's the HV LP valve. I think that's from Medtronics and Asculab. Uh, uh, Mithke has gone back to their dual switch valve for LP. You can use the normal Sirtas valves and Progav valves uh, um, for LP as well. If you are going to use Progav valve, you have to then put it vertically. The LP valve once again works with the same mechanism in the sense that when the patient is horizontal, um, this part only works. This one with the um, uh, so sapphire or ball, they are horizontal and they don't cause resistance. But when the patient is standing, then the weight of these come down. So now the patient has these two mechanisms increasing the resistance and decreasing the, the um, uh, um, flow. As I said, the Asculab Mitke dual switch valve is again a system for LP uh, lumbar peritoneal shunts. Catheters, there are many different catheters, silver impregnated, antibiotic impregnated, and the basic trial uh, showed that the antibiotic pregnated was uh, better than silver impregnated one. Choice of valves depends on the profile and the size, uh, depend on the age of the patient, the skin of the patient, and whether you are going to put it in line or in burr hole. This is an important concept. I really want you to... Uh, a, a, a grasp that we neurosurgeons not, not necessarily know. There was a nice uh, review on the child's nervous system by Dr. Barami and uh, Dr. Sood. Um, it's called Starling resistor. Uh, uh, so, for example, you know, when I when I lie down and stand up, if the if uh, the veins were able to just uh, drain um, spontaneously down, then my pressure every time I stand up and a stand up should drop down dramatically. It's thought that this is uh, usually um, offset by what's called a Starling resistor mechanism, uh, either at the junction between transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus, or at the junction of the um, uh, veins that connect to the sagittal sinus, the, the bridging veins. The idea is that you get a vein, you get another vein, but on this small area is soft. So when I stand up, what happens is that the pre, let's say that this is in the junction of the um, uh, transverse sinus and sphenoid sinus. And when I stand up, the, the CS of pressure then closes this one. So then what it does is that it prevents the uh, uh, veins to freely, freely drain. We know that when we stand up, the internal jugular vein collapses so that there's no, no over drainage. So the idea is that when we do put a shunt on a patient and the patient has a already is over draining, what happens is that they don't have the stalling effect. I think this we have Dr. Chinali mentioned, if the patient is already has a low pressure and when you ask them to then stand up, then this 
this um, Starling effect is also neutralized. And then there's a lot of venous, uh, uh, venous uh, uh, efflux from the brain and down to spinal uh, veins because they don't have, and that causes even more drop in um, ICP. And uh, the thought in the review, I will really uh, advise all of you to have a read of that review. Um, the good ideas, it might be that the reason that we have this low, low, low pressure ventricular megaly lower, as well as in patients with um, who have uh, uh, increased pressure, but the ventricular size doesn't go up in chronic hydrocephalus may all to do with uh, something that emanates from this this. Uh, um, this principle. So, uh, uh, so in future, what's going to happen? I'm sure there will be a system where ICP is coupled to uh, uh, the drainage. It's all electronic, and uh, we, as uh, we, our previous speakers mentioned, a system that is what you call we can actually know the how much is the flow. That's the main problem at the moment. We don't know how much is the flow, and um, low cost. So, thank you very much. Uh, and I, as I mentioned, it's good to understand the different shunt, no, not shunt, shunt hardware, and hardware, so that we can make rational decisions. And understanding the basic ideas of physics will help neurosurgeons to help with the future development of ideal shunt system. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take it at the end. Uh, uh, we will try to see whether Dr. Montelis can join us. Let's see. Professor uh, Montelis, can you try sharing your presentation, please? Great, thank you very much. If you can unmute your microphone. Uh, let me see what's in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Mortelis, uh, can you increase the volume of your microphone because the microphone is on? Okay. You may have a technical problem. Um, Do you have any uh, questions to Professor Chinali, um, Dr. Krishnamurti? Nara, maybe, yep. this, maybe the solution of all this is the recent introduction of the endovascular treatment of hydrocephalus. You, you read that uh, the first time uh, in human this has been performed. This is possibly the future. People endovascularly through the uh, sigmoid sinus were able to implant uh, a transmural, transmural uh, drainage device that wow. was draining CSF directly into the, into the transmural sinus. This has been done in an old patient, I think 80, 80 years old otherwise inoperable because of uh, several associated conditions. And uh, this is possibly the future, you know? Yes, I mean, that one, that's 
that would be absolutely ideal, isn't it? Uh, yeah. If if that could be possible, and uh, okay, uh, has started screen share. Um, I think we are having problem with Professor Montalise's audio and okay. Uh, Dr. Kathy Mazola is with us. Uh, Dr. Mazola, um, uh, Dr. Mazola wrote the wrote the uh, evidence-based guidelines for the CNS. Uh, Dr. Mazola, do you have any comments uh, from your experience on? Um... No, I just um, I did want to say thank you for having this uh, wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at, I am in Hawaii at the yeah. American <laughs> Society of Pediatric Surgery meeting. So I was only able to log on for the latter part of the talks. And, uh, but I wanted to say thank you for hosting this. And the talks so far have been wonderful. You know, so many of these children, you know, are challenging for us, especially, you know, as they grow up, those that develop slip ventricular syndrome. And, uh, you know, we always try to do the best for our patients. So thank you again for hosting this. Oh, thank you very much. I hope- Hello, uh, Siti. Uh, I hope- uh, Kathy, I feel sorry for you that you're in Hawaii. <laughs> 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 Enjoy a little bit of sunshine from us. <laughs> thank you. You can get to see a little bit through the camera here. I was up today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, do you have any questions uh, for Dr. Professor Chinali? Uh, and we will try to see whether we can connect to Dr. Professor Montalis uh, in the next five minutes. I, I, I do have a couple of thoughts. I don't know. Sure, please. Uh, uh, if if uh, anyone can answer. The first thought is that um, the presence or absence of venous sinus stenosis, like we see in pseudotumor cerebri. And lately we've been um, identifying a fair number of people who have venous sinus stenosis in pseudotumor cerebri, and my endovascular colleagues put a stent in them, and patients have resolved symptoms. Instead of putting a shunt in them or asking them to go bypass surgery, et cetera, you can see a huge gradient uh, across the stenosis. And my second thought is there is some patients who have hydrocephalus for a transient period of time. Perhaps putting shunts in them is not a great idea. And I wish there was a way to identify them because you can go back and see when, when the shunt was inserted, the ventricles were very big and dilated and there would have been no question that the patients needed the shunt. Uh, so I wonder, if you had any thoughts or anybody else had thoughts on this. Professor Sinali. Well, these are uh, both uh, difficult issues. Uh, I have no experience in uh, endovascular stenting of, uh, ideally, I know it works very nicely in, uh, in adults. Uh, there is possibility of measuring uh, the, the gradient and uh, the endovascular guys, they uh, make the difference between the uh, implantable and non-implantable uh, patients. I mean, if there is a gradient, they put a stand and uh, then it works. Otherwise, if there is no pressure gradient across the uh, hypothetic uh, stenosis, they do not implant any stand. And then these patients go to the uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt. Uh, I am not aware if there is uh, any uh, experience in children uh, our attitude is um, uh, much easier. That means basically 99% of uh, pseudotumor cerebri in the children are resolved by uh, one or two up to three lumbar, lumbar tapping. Uh, the rate of recurrence after the first lumbar tapping uh, is approximately 5%. And uh, that 5% within the first year can still be managed by uh, a second or a third lumbar tapping. Uh, so uh, I think it's much easier, much less expensive, uh, much less invasive, and uh, extremely effective treatment uh, of a pseudotumor if compared to the uh, endovascular stenting. 
pathology, pathophysiology is very different from adults, of course. So it's uh, uh, may, maybe maybe Carmine is ready to to talk. Sure, I hope so. Uh, um, sorry, Professor uh, Mortelis. I hope uh, it's just the, the the voice is not coming through. Can you try to talk? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, brilliant. Excellent. Thank you, Armand. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have some uh, technical, technical problem. problem. So I, I, need, I need to have my uh, phone and I use my. my uh, if it can work, work way, I can continue. So uh, thank you very much. I hope to go. Um, very fast because we are late, and so uh, we have and there are many things about the sleep syndrome, uh, and that there is a, a mechanical complication for a hyperfunctioning shunt. Uh, so, Know what's happened. The history of that is very nice. Uh, move for so the incident is about. Uh, percent of the shunted patients and varies between one and 15 percent uh, and uh, you can you can see now this is a, a very recent uh, literature uh, the use of programmable valve has reduced the incidence of this uh, uh, and we have not to uh, forget that there is some uh, possible lethal complication when we speak about uh, the slit ventricle syndrome, we see a good thing. Uh, a clinical uh, um, slit ventricle syndrome and radiological uh, slit ventricle syndrome. We have to treat the only uh, patient that have symptomatology. This is uh, uh, evident for me, and uh, uh, I think that uh, it's uh, uh, important to remember some publication that. Uh, Show that there is some difference between radiological and clinical incidents. So, what uh, happen in this uh, situation that a uh, hyper drainage can uh, give an uh, anomaly of the compliance of the uh, brain, and there is some uh, in, uh, diminution of the size of the ventricular field, and, and uh, the ventricular catheter can be. Uh, blocked, the ventricles are not compliant, and so we have a, a, a loss of the yes, cerebral expansion. So, uh, the Riketi described the symptomatology, and uh, this uh, symptom, uh, syndrome appears late in during the, the, the year. So, there is some uh, in, uh, important risk factor that all people have uh, already um, reported. And uh, uh, I am agree with the way uh, I was, I ever, ever say, said that uh, we have to put attention to the open impression of the shunt at the beginning. But uh, it's uh, also true for me that we have choice of the good opening of the shunt uh, for each patient. This is a this important uh, situation. So what appears after this, in this symptom that uh, the, uh, there is some different theory that uh, are related to the cranial vertebral, uh, cranial um, uh, disproportion, uh, periventricular gliosis, uh, venous congestion, ventricular isolation, capillary uh, isolation, lasmus, and theory on the stiffness. It is important uh, uh, intracranial hypertension. Uh, theoretically, yes. Uh, if you have to do this uh, uh, recording, we have to uh, uh, do this uh, recording for at least 48 hours. And uh, for me, it's also important the perfusion uh, uh, test is so we want to know better what is the resistance to the 
um, the CSF uh, outflow uh, and the resistance of our, our system. This is a particular um, uh, tool, very well tolerated by children also in a small age. And uh, we have also to, um, to uh, give importance to some uh, anomaly that we can find. And uh, it is very important the, 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 the monitoring of intracranial uh, pressure because you can see the change that we can observe. But uh, this is uh, before the surgical procedure, this is after the surgical procedure. But it's also true that now it's a well established what's happening. If you have a true uh, slit ventricle syndrome, Generally, when the patient arrives in that condition, the monitoring of the intracranial pressure shows that the pressure is increased. One of the things that's important for me is to study the uh, uh, blood flow. And you can see that, that when you study this, the blood flow, there is always in this situation a reduction of the uh, cerebral blood flow. That means that the, blood, the brain cannot work well. So there is some uh, things that are common with the different uh, uh, situation uh, with the uh, normal volume of cells or this syndrome event is also uh, the situation that we call a pseudotumor cell. It's sure that uh, the surgical procedure arrive always after that uh, medical treatment was done. And uh, as uh, already uh, many uh, speakers uh, say, that we can have a shunt revision, a shunt renewal, and we can uh, make again a new programmable shunt. We can uh, put another uh, um, catheters or to propose an ETB. But we have to remember that there's some um, indication because uh, to do a ETV in a slight ventricle can be very, 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 very difficult. And uh, I want to stress that you do ATV with a slight ventricle to use the neural navigation. You asked me to speak about the bone decompression. And when um, we speak about the bone decompression, uh, we have to uh, remember that if, you, if we increase the surface of the brain, we can observe generally in diminution of the rapport between the pressure and the surface. So uh, it's sure that with this kind of surgical procedure, you can have a role uh, to um, decrease the intracranial pressure. Many uh, surgical procedures have been reported. Uh, this one is the posterior parietal expansion that was proposed by my friend Alan Giorni and also by Ezio Di Rocco. That, as you can see, uh, is based on the, uh, the, the, the fact that we can uh, um, uh, practice two uh, uh, bone flap in the parieto parieto occipital region, respecting the uh, the, the board that uh, is on the, si on the side. This was a proposal to, to avoid the problem with the lesion to the uh, longitudinal signs in the posterior, in posterior part. But I see that if we want to have a very good result, we can remove also the bone flap on the, the sign. Because if you put attention technically, if you can do this without increasing the, the, the risk of the procedure. And this way you can, can uh, observe the uh, increase of the uh, volume of the, of, the, of the stool and so the decrease of the intracranial hypertension is, is at the end of the surgical procedure. In my, uh, I, I generally uh, now, if you do this uh, posterior approach, I prefer to uh, um, uh, open completely the cranial uh, valve and uh, to do this, uh, put attention waste to do some uh, two bar row from uh, one side or each side of the sinus and have a good dissection between the uh, bone and the dilemmata to avoid lesion to the venous system. This is another example. 
and uh, uh, you can have a very large flap with a good result that you can put again and the, the, the flap is always left focused so you can leave the, 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 the school off. Concerning the frontal bone flap advancement, this surgical procedure was proposed by Professor Lapra in the, uh, thinking that uh, it could be uh, uh, possible to open the uh, frontal region and to push, uh, to push the bone uh, forward. And this gave the possibility to increase the volume of the stool and uh, to increase also the uh, volume of the organ. This is what uh, uh, happened. Uh, the bone flap is very large. I think that uh, you have to put uh, uh, attention to go laterally and to go, uh, open also the, ter the terminal region. And after you can uh, push, uh, as you can see in uh, this example, the bone uh, forward. Uh, it worked for the, to control the intracranial pressure, but there is some problem. This is an old uh, 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 slide, but uh, you can see that there is an increase that can give a, uh, uh, aesthetic problem in the suit. And uh, you can see what you can add, and uh, it's uh, true that uh, it uh, could be uh, problematic sometimes from aesthetic um, point of view. So I think that, that we could uh, propose other uh, solution. And uh, so I think that we can uh, practice the frontal advancement in, uh, with a, a modified technique. You can do a very large uh, uh, frontal board that uh, you have, uh, have to be a standard lateral and the basal school removing the uh, pterinoral region on both sides and going posterior the uh, coronal suture two centimeters to avoid the problem with the longitudinal sign more posterior. And you can have a very large uh, surface to improve the uh, volume and the, uh, of the of the of the, um, uh, the, the so you can observe when you remove uh, the, the flap. And uh, in my technique, after I we have to reduce the thickness of the of the of the flap in in, in a way that uh, when you uh, put again in place the bone flap, you have no important modification of the external cranial um, uh, um, bone. Uh, this is what you can observe. It's not, uh, you have to leave floating the, the flat posterior, and you can increase also the volume with the uh, linear osteotomy that you can uh, practice. This is what happened uh, uh, after the surgical procedure and uh, some uh, months after with a good aesthetic control. It's clear that you can put attention if, uh, for the, from technical point of view, uh, normally you can do a two bar all from one uh, each side of the of, of, of the of the longitudinal sinus, and you have put attention to dissect carefully uh, the uh, dura from the internal uh, internal bone. So you, uh, the problem that you can have, you have to open the dura mater or not. I, I think that uh, it depends on the uh, amount of the intracranial pressure and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the clinical state of the, of the patient or the patient. So you say in this case, I have done, I have opened the dura mater. And if you open the dura mater, you need a uh, graph and uh, each neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon can use what he prefers. After you have this work to reduce the thickness of the bone, and you have to arrive to have what you can see on the right side, that that's a very thin um, uh, uh, flap that you can put again, and you can close the the the, the canal bolt, and this is the, at the end of the surgical procedure. So these are some example. Okay, this case of. Uh, 
of of sleep uh, ventricle, and this is what uh, what was the the, the 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 patient before the surgical procedure, and uh, this uh, what happened. You can see the reduction of the um, of the bone of the bone, and uh, this is the result after the surgical procedure. It's sure that uh, it's important to have the, the monitoring of the intracranial pressure. But uh, I think also that you are always in standard that the situation. The patients are not well. Uh, the patients uh, are monitored. The intracranial pressure increases. So now I have to say that uh, when I am in this particular situation, I do the surgical procedure and I don't know uh, do the monitor. What is important for me uh, is the control of the uh, cerebral flow because uh, you uh, is an important element also for the uh, uh, differential diagnosis. And in all cases that uh, um, we had, uh, the um, uh, blood flow is always reduced, also in the frontal uh, region. This is for me is very important. So after the, the surgical procedure, it's very uh, difficult to, to believe me that it is an, an important uh, increase of the uh, uh, blood flow. Uh, in this slide, I could uh, show you that there is uh, not in all cases, uh, but in uh, much more that. Uh, um, are um, uh, cases that uh, the, uh, the blood flow uh, uh, became normal after the procedure. So this is another example with uh, a patient that this this decrease of the slight ventricular symptom of the of the uh, of the um, cerebral the 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 the, 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 the flap that is reduced and remain in place. Reporting, and this is the change of the pressure that we have to do uh, to improve the uh, result. Another example with the resistance of slight ventricle. This is what, uh, what happened after. This is uh, another patient that was, was operated for anhydrocephalo post hemorrhagic with the large ventricle. The patient uh, was treated at two years old. This is the, 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 the evolution, and you can see from one side to the other side the the, the difference. And what is important, you can see the uh, expansion of the of, of the of the cranial bulk uh, without to, to push the 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 the, 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 the bone flap forward. And the uh, change that you need of the uh, opening pressure of the valve. So we had uh, find that um, 30 patients in all my uh, career now that arrive at the, at the end. And you can see that the, uh, before the, this procedure, we change always the, the pressure of the valve. We change the valve, it doesn't work. But uh, with this technique, the uh, cranial expansion, all patients improved. The morbidity was uh, really uh, very low. And you can see that uh, the CT scan can uh, uh, um, remain with the slight ventricle from radiological point of view, but the patients are better. And in, uh, in the other patient, there is a normalization of the volume, but uh, only in six patients in our experience is an increase of the size of the vent. This is the, the aesthetical result, that's not uh, uh, bad. And uh, the, the, the the disappearance of the clinical symptomatology was observed in the main number of the patients. But what was important that uh, there is a, a good evolution in patients that uh, were scolarized of the, the school. So at uh, the, the end of this uh, talk, I think that uh, it's, it's true. It's very important uh, the monitoring the intracranial pressure, but uh, if you have elements that you are in, in phase two syndrome 
for the last uh, at least 20 years, you can do if the other um, measures that I have done are uh, not responsive to do directly the um, procedure, the procedure uh, with uh, um, also using the, um, the uh, cranial expansion. Uh, this is a patient that was a treater uh, after a slit ventricular center with the endoscopy, but uh, in the true case of the very slit ventricle, the very small ventricle, this technique can be very uh, difficult uh, to do. Also, it can uh, work in many uh, cases. This is uh, in conclusion that the ventricular syndrome is related to a multifactorial factor. The pathophysiology is still now complete and understood. There is a serious beginning and intracranial hypotension followed than intracranial hypertension with in uh, cerebral hypoperfusion. I said that I represent in my, uh, my sense the essential element that characterizes the disorder. So uh, if uh, the medical treatment is not effective, the change of opening of pressure of the shunt or the increase of resistance to food seem uh, very important, but if not, uh, all these measures are not effective. Cranial volume expan expansion represents a good option to increase the intracranial volume, to control the Virginia sign, to obtain a good uh, aesthetical result. And at the end, it's sure the best uh, um, message is that you can put in care uh, the, the open impression of each shunt that have to be tired for each uh, patient. And so you can prevent uh, this thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, Professor Mortalis, for that fantastic uh, um, lecture. And it's very useful as a reference as well. When we come to that uh, end, we are we wonder what we are what we can do. Um, I just want to see whether Dr. Venkataraman and Dr. Neelam Venkataraman, do you want to make any comments, sir? Yes, Naren. Please, thanks. Yeah, this is uh, regarding the thought which Satish was discussing about. Yeah. Uh, we have found about uh, seven patients now with uh, venous stenosis where our endovascular guys have placed shunts. All of them have been diagnosed earlier as the BIH or an empty cellar syndrome and, and variety of diagnosis. Many of them were on different kind of medical treatments, including steroids, acetazolamide, etc. And post uh, shunting, interestingly, all of them have improved, you know, including the visual symptoms, headaches have come down. They are completely off the uh, medications which they were early off. So I just wanted to share the experience. In that, interestingly, we had one child with about uh, 16 year old who had this uh, uh, recurrent shunt problems and also had either he had a subdural or a slit ventricle. Again, he had a hypoplastic transverse uh, sinus. And uh, with the dilatation of the sinus, he improved symptomatically. So that seems to be a, a, a etiology which is related to the venous drainage in uh, slit ventricles. Probably uh, it affects the uh, interstitial space and its uh, lymphatic absorption, probably. So resulting into a kind of a parenchymal um, uh, dysfunction as well. So they seem to improve with the endovascular treatment. Probably future should uh, look into this problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Venkat Ramana. Uh, many of you may not know, he was my, he was one of my uh, senior most residents when I was doing residency in my previous life in Nimhans. Good to see you. Good to see you, Satish. And uh, Dr. And uh, thank you. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Krishnamurti, do you have any questions for uh, Professor Motolis? Uh, have you done or seen any uh, skull expansion for uh, slit ventricular syndrome? Uh, I personally have not done cranial expansion, although I have done some uh, Chiari decompressions on an occasional patient uh, who, who needed, who had a Chiari because of the over drainage. Um, I have not personally done, but very good results. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mortelis, there's a question from uh, Williams. Uh, uh, the question is, what are the indications for 
cranial expansion, uh, what's the best age for that? And is there an age limit? You can do a bit of education. Education is very easy in my sense to answer this question. Because the education, when you have to have done everything that you can uh, to uh, avoid uh, this technique, it's mean a change of the opening pressure of the, of the shaft. If uh, uh, the shaft is uh, working or not, if the shaft is not working, you need a um, revision and changing, uh, changing of the, the system. But if all these things uh, does not um, work, uh, and so you have not a plan <coughs> to oppose the patient to the clear good indication. When uh, at the work page, when the patients are not going the well, uh, the, 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 the patient that uh, was a more young was uh, three years uh, old now in this, in this uh, scale. I think that uh, you have to propose this uh, when uh, you need. In a small baby, what is uh, um, uh, important is that uh, you can uh, remove the bone and to put again uh, leaving the 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 the, the, the flat of cloth because you cannot reduce the the, the, the thickness of the of the bone flat. In the other you can uh, reduce the, the thickness. Uh, this is a technique uh, to be proposed uh, to be proposed when the other option to treat these uh, symptoms uh, uh, does not give uh, result. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mortalis. Dr. Masola, um, I know that you are just trying to make us feel better uh, by showing Hawaii sea line. Uh, my, my father studied his MSc in Hawaii, so uh, it is, it's a place that I, I am very fond of. Uh, do you have any comments to Dr. Masola? Yes, I do. So Thanks. one thing I wanted to add, I, I thought the, pre, the most recent presentation was excellent, and I have done a few cranial expansion surgeries. So when you see children who are coming to the emergency room complaining of headaches and their CT scan or slit-like ventricles, always look at the shunt series, the skull x-rays. Very often you'll see that there is second craniosynostosis that you will not see any future, but you will see signs of elevated pressure. So if you take that child to the operating room to explore the shunt, I recommend at that time placing an intracranial pressure monitor and watching that child for a few days. Because if you demonstrate in the operating room that the shunt is indeed working, but over the next few days the pressure goes up, then you might have a case of increased pressure, secondary the secondary to, you know, craniosynostosis and slit ventricle syndrome. Those children typically do very, very well with cranial expansion, whether you do a bone flap advancement frontally, parietally, or if you do uh, take the bone over the sagittal sinus off and do multiple lateral barrel staves and then rut them open with the bone you remove from the sagittal sinus. And increasing the intracranial volume, I really uh, think that also helps reduce the uh, quote-unquote stenosis and uh, or venous outflow that we see in some children. Uh, as long as you address, you know, expand to the posterior and uh, sinuses and sagittal sinus. So that was just my comment. But always look at your skull X-rays on shunt X-ray. They can tell you a lot of information about the child. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, sure, uh, prof, Professor. I can, I can uh, because I didn't hear very well because uh, sometimes the, the, the sound was uh, stopped. But uh, my, my, my answer is that uh, it, it is sure that before to propose uh, 
first thing that we think and that generally we compare the programmable value or uh, value that can be modified, uh, we can uh, increase the open space. This is uh, the best uh, command. So if we have to go uh, to put a revision, yes, for me, we have to do But uh, when I, we have done a revision, and theoretically we use good choice, the good open invention, and you know that the, 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 the residual the, the, the chance is open, you can propose this kind of thing. So, in my, my, my opinion, there is no possibility to do this. You can open the, the volume of the prime uh, procedure. If you open the prime procedure, you, I, uh, I respect two things in, uh, uh, that for me are very important. You have to increase the, uh, the volume of the, of the school as large as you can. And so, I think that you can take uh, uh, with the prudence, the, 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 the risk to open completely the posterior, uh, uh, the posterior ball. And uh, uh, I go uh, 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 a little bit parallel to transversal sinus, and uh, I open the, the, the posterior part anterior towards the parietal box. And I do this uh, passing on the, on the side, but you have to put attention uh, when you have a intracranial hypertension to have a, a good exposition of the dura and uh, to um, have a good dissection of the dura mater for the bone, especially if the, the child is uh, young, because the, as, you say, as you know, uh, every people know, uh, the, 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 the Lambert and Suit are very. Um, like attachment to, to the book. But if you respect the things that is, is, is rules, uh, there is no very important condition. The, the, problem, the problem that uh, um, the criticism is that, that the posterior, if you can have a lesion of the sun, on the sinus, the, the concept can be, uh, can, can be uh, more important. So for, the, for this reason, that in, uh, in uh, you can propose an anterior translation, but we call this anterior translation, but it's not more the good term because you increase only reducing the thickness of the of the of the of the bone, uh, the uh, bone. And this respect to the language of the law uh, uh, of the moral heavy law. If you reduce uh, the uh, of the little bone. The pressure, the pressure goes down in, in, in the same in the same way that if you inject a little volume and after the steady state uh, equilibrium, you have an important increase of the of the of the pressure. This the, this reverse we have is a, 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 a been observed by myself, but, um, not only in this patient, but also in uh, uh, when we do a very large crop also in other pathologies like, like um, in a traumatic case. Um, but what is important for me is to open laterally the, the region of the perioneal the perioneal region both sides uh, to have a lateral expansion and uh, this is for me is very important. After the, there are uh, I, I, I imagine is a new modification of the um, property of the of the brain that adapts to this new volume and generally the patient to as well. So in this way I, I do my my choice. So uh, is a, is a, is, a, is a, uh, I do this. I have not uh, many many patients with this this uh, syndrome uh, decrease during the time because uh, now we have learned to adapt the open impression also in very older uh, children uh, at the beginning. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, this rate of uh, the incidence of uh, this mental is uh, uh, became a very small that in the past. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mortalis. That's very insightful and uh, i'm pleased to say that everything is recorded so i will send you the link it's already on the youtube before i go i just 
two men two things to mention one is a uh, professor uh, uh, sofia zosnika she's here she's a world uh, leader in uh, sh- about shunts and she and uh, uh, professor marek zosnia i don't know whether she can unmute herself but any thoughts from her i think we need a lecture from her on uh, on shunts and uh, uh, csf dynamics uh, Um, but if she can't unmute that's fine uh, the other thing is that i worked in bristol and uh, my former colleague my my in mr edwards in uh, bristol what he does with the um, uh, slit ventricular syndrome is that what he gets the ophthalmologist uh, to do a, a optic nerve fenestration and then he sets the shunt pressure up and it really works nicely uh, because uh, you know when you have these headaches the patient's pressures are not 20 or 25 but they are usually 30 40 50 and by doing the uh, i only saw one case by doing the optic nerve fenestration you are protecting the eye then increasing the um, shunt setting to 20 uh, it increases the size of the ventricle so it doesn't get blocked and the patient does well so uh, i saw this operation and that i was in the department for another another nine another Uh, 11 months and the patient didn't come back so that's another another strategy i just wanted to mention so i just want to uh, uh, thank uh, mr amedio callisto uh, for chairing and for professor dia pujari for chairing uh, uh, expertly both of them and for the eminent speakers uh, uh, from professor dr uh, harold ricket dr george lazarov um dr krishnamurthy uh, satish krishnamurthy uh, uh, dr professor uh, chinali dr uh, prodhom and uh, professor uh, motali so i really appreciate professor motali he finished a three day conference the 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 leon hydrocephalus conference I, i again want to stress if you are interested in hydrocephalus you really have to try to attend it either uh, uh in person or in by webinar next year and then him managing trying to sort out that audio problem very nicely uh, very ne- neurosurgical in terms of trying to find a solution so i hope you all found this um found this uh, symposium useful and timely and you got lots of ideas and uh, as i said i will email you the link for the recording that you can then look through So thank you very much to everyone. I think we did overrun and we had two two extra lectures than we had but I hope this is all worth it and thanks for your forbearance and wishing you a great week ahead. Thank you and bye for now. Thanks Naran. Take care everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you tomorrow.